welcome to another episode of the Christian Reeve Podcast. If you like this here show, make sure you leave us a review on Podchaser. Or, alternatively, if you're listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or elsewhere, please consider leaving a review and a rating. If you're checking out the Christian Reeve Podcast on YouTube, Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you want to support the show, why not check us out on patreon.com slash Christian Reeve and get yourself exclusive bonus content and bonus podcast content. How about that? Okay, I've had my fun. But seriously, if you want to support the show, it really, really helps us out. So thank you so much. And thanks again for listening. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Christian Reeve podcast. Today's guest is an actor, filmmaker, director, writer and more. And he's also my friend. Welcome to the show, Dan McGee. How are you doing? Very good, mate. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a good pleasure. Yeah, happy yeah, new year. Was, yeah. Happy New Year. Yeah, I haven't seen you since last year. So <laughs> how are you doing? How are you doing? Very good, man. Very good. It's fairly quiet this time of year, especially with acting jobs, filming jobs. This um, year, I've noticed this. I mean... Because I've been pursuing this about four or five years, but I know you've been in the industry a lot longer. So, like, I'll tell you what, first question, seasonal, what does it look like? So an actor's journey, I know that there's a lot of work in summer, and I know there can be towards the end of the year, but everything is always, you're, you're working in advance. That's kind of what I learned about the industry so far. But your experience over the last sort of, I think it's eight or nine, coming up on nine years, it must be now. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, uh, 2016 was, I, I was making films before that, but 2016 was when I kind of went fully into it. Ah, interesting. Okay, so... Well, so did... Yes, yeah, so basically I was working, when I first moved to Manchester, I was working in Weatherspoons and because it was a job. And then I left that to carry on work on the Christmas markets in Manchester. And then... When it came to January, all of a sudden I don't have a job because I left Weatherspoons to go on to the Christmas market, which is obviously seasonal. So when it came to January, it was just a case of being pretty much self-employed and going fully into acting, whether it be student films, just saying yes to any project that was out there. Do you want to be an extra in a student job? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. Just because it's networking and that's how you build a friendship. And then when it comes to making films yourself, you have almost a database of actors that you would work with or who you wouldn't work with again um, and carry on from that. Since then, my career in the industry is, uh, I'm doing a lot more projects as the years go on until obviously a couple of years ago when it stopped for every everyone. And now I mainly do, through the summer, I do a lot of music festivals, which is my normal job. And then I will do the Christmas markets again. Because the markets don't start until May, I have five months where I can just make films, whether it be saying yes to a friend's film, doing any extras work, um, anything I can do, really. And then towards the end of the year, I also have about two months before the Christmas market starts where I can try and fill my calendar with any jobs I can. But obviously, because it's so quiet in January, there's not much going on. I had an essay job yesterday for a tv series and then i have a a production next week but then there's nothing in the foreseeable future of what i'll be doing you're you're a person that really confuses me and i'll tell you why so Uh dan doesn't know this but me and the people in our kind of circle because every every kind of actor filmmaker has like their immediate circle and then people you meet on jobs through other jo- you know what i'm saying like it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger bigger but there's people that you work with like i think we've worked together oh my god uh we, we've worked together on i met you valentine's day <laughs> <laughs> that was when i met oh you oh my god it was valentine's day yeah shit it was a corporate shoot in media city wasn't it oh yeah let's tell that story real quick so um that was one of my first (laughs) oh yeah is it yeah i suppose there would be like an nda on it wouldn't there maybe maybe not i don't know it's out now it's all out now yeah it was was in the news (laughs) oh my god yeah so we we did this um 
a series of SA jobs for a company. Uh, I won't say their name. Um, what well, to be fair, it wasn't even the the this this com company. I don't know if it's a legit company or not. I don't know if it's real or not. But they came to the production company that we were employed by. So hands up, that's nothing to do with us. Um, and we essentially just took on these jobs. We'd show up. We'd have different roles every single time. And this one I remember was strange in that, like, we're all dressed in corporate attire and we're just sitting in a in a, in a board meeting style room, uh, but it's like a press conference. And I remember that there was two guys doing the, um, the, spe the speech, but the speech was, oh, it's so weird. So I've seen people do, like, improvised speeches before or, or scripted speeches that are just a bit weird. And it... You can tell that they were trying to just do B-roll, essentially. They just want someone speaking, da 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 da, da. But they prepared a whole speech, and it felt like it was a text-to-speech document, like someone's just done Google Translate into another language, and then that's what the end result is. <laughs> and so, so all I remember from that speech was just little things like, the company will do... X, Y, and Z in the year 2020. And the company has had uh, tremendous results. It just felt like a really bad fever dream. I don't know. Is yes, I remember because I think I was a cameraman for this corporate, <laughs> this big corporate event. And during the filming process, the behind the scenes people would come over saying, would you like to be interviewed? for this oh and i remember saying absolutely not i don't want any part of this if it comes out i'm just a photographer with this project in a project if you know what i mean we dodged the bullet there i'll get to that in a second i just want to mention mike because while you had just like a camera and you look like a legitimate part of this they gave me what i can only describe as the world's oldest video camera. it was straight out of the 1980s and i had to it wasn't plugged in or anything i had to pretend like i was filming which i can do that no worries but it's like if you're looking in the background and you see a guy in the year 2020 2021 whatever it was uh with an 80s camera you're gonna be like why has he got a 1980s camera not plugged in that's a bit weird <laughs> <laughs> like, is, is it like a vintage shoot like what's, i don't know it was a very strange experience and all of them seemed to be like that each and every time and yeah, those those interviews, because as you as you mentioned earlier, it was on the news. And from what I understand, I don't know. This is yeah, just legal disclaimer. I don't know, but from what I understand, maybe that company was involved with some shady dealings. Maybe not. I don't know. But apparently, it was on BBC News, so that was funny. So technically, we've been on the news. There you go. We, we worked <laughs> with them again a, a few weeks after. Yeah, um, I think I was playing like an MP or something. Oh, oh, cool! Wow. <laughs> no, you were there. You were there. The MP. Um, hmm. It was. We were filming in the city centre of Manchester. It was. It was the same people hired us, and it was where we were talking with Mark, the essay, and I think you were giving him advice about social media presence. Oh, yeah. Do you know what? Because I remember we, we, went for a pint. we went for a drink afterwards. Yes. And then they called me back saying, we need to get like a stock picture of the, yeah. you know, the, the corporate people. So I remember we had to drink up Christian. We'll need to go back. <laughs> so, yeah, that was the second time we worked with them. And then I think I met you in Liverpool yes. on one of the um, Indian. It's not Bollywood, is it? Is it called Nollywood? Films that are... But, yeah, yeah, but you're, you're right, Bollywood. I found this out recently. Bollywood is a, apparently an umbrella term. So it doesn't have to specifically refer to Bollywood movies. It could just be any movie that's kind of that part of the world. Nollywood is Nigeria, oh. I think. I think. Is it really? I, I thought it was films that are made outside of anyway, regardless. It was I might a... be wrong, but I think I think that's true. I don't know. But yeah, that was that was the one of the Liverpool. Yeah. And then there was another one in <laughs> And, and then we did another. Uh, that was with the same guys, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, at the car wash. The uh -huh. car wash, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, well, uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. And they dressed and you then, up as a cop and then you didn't get used. <laughs> get paid to drink, drink chai tea and eat curry all day. That's not 
It's not Happy the worst days. job ever, is it? No, but I'll take it. The thing with those, with those jobs, the catering is unbelievable for the Bollywood shoots. That's true. Can't can't fault that. The catering's I, good anyway, because I've done catering on Brassic, so the catering is always good, but especially on those shoots. You done Brassic as well? I did Brassic for like five minutes. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say what I was shooting yesterday. But yeah. I've, I've been on set of Brassic, but just working catering. Uh, so oh. the hospitality department. Oh. Not, actually, not as an essay, just, you know, the guys who serve the food for breakfast. Yeah. And yeah, I was basically doing that for about five times, I think. But I've never actually been on it, so. <laughs> I, I was on there for an hour. Uh, yeah, an hour. An Were hour. you just passing by? No, like they. Oh, I guess I can't say much. So basically, like I was, um, it was an essay job for Brassic, and uh, we waited for hours. You know, like when they bring you to like uh, a location where there's the setup, and then you drive to the where it's actually being filmed. Every time. Every yeah. time. Yeah. So they did that, and the actual filming. I kid you not. It was it was like half an hour, an hour maybe. And we we're done. I was like, "Really? That's it?" And they're like, "Yep." I'm like, All right, cool. Go home. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. It's See, like that's the shorts, isn't it? If, if, uh... if ever you've done Emmerdale, EastEnders, Coronation Street, Hollyoaks, um, it's always the same because the, the turnaround is so quick. The key thing about it is you get that's the thing. If if it works out like that, you get paid for a full day's work despite having only been there in an hour or two. That's when it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it gets in overtime, that's when everyone claps. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we, we did a job in, just a, a quick detour, we did a job in Huddersfield, and it was for a, an agency. I think it was the first agency I signed up with, and they had managed to talk the extras down in terms of wage by going to the production saying, we will have maybe 30% more essays if you go with our agency, but we'll charge you the same. Um, I think now there's a disclaimer when you sign up for a job not to discuss pay on set. This was in 2016, I believe. Um, and we worked out that we were getting paid £60 flat fee a day, £60 for 10 hours. But then because of this company, it was the first job of the year, they take £40 off every person for the first job. And they're taking 20%. And you have to pay your own way to Huddersfield and back. So when we worked out, we were earning about ten pound a day for four Literally days. Back back. Ten pound a day. So we just every time that the cameras would, okay, guys, stand off for ten minutes. We're just going to flip the cameras, and you know what they do. I just run to the pub with uh, my friend who was on set, and we just neck a pint and run back. So by the end of the show, we're, hey, because we figured we're not doing it for the money because there's no money involved yeah we'll just try and have as good a time as possible what's the worst essay job you ever did i've i've, I've fell out with so many people <laughs> but it's never normally the production or the job it's always there's just a bad assistant director there or there's someone who's just not uh communicating well with the essays there was a two-day job. It's not the worst one, but it's one that just comes to mind. We were filming at Old Granada Studios in Manchester, and it was a music video, and it was a oh yeah, like yeah a, a festival scene. It was a festival scene, <laughs> and we were all make believing that we're having a good time and we're drinking water in wine in wine glasses, but then they needed a lot of. Uh, guys who do the cocktails and the light the whatever they do and they're doing all the flips with the bottles and stuff like that they needed basically empty bottles so they bought cases of wine and were tipping it down the sink in the i walked in the the bathroom and they're just pouring 50 bottles of wine down the sink because they need empty bottles so i was going over to the age i was going why don't you just give us drinks not everyone here is driving i wasn't driving at the time we yeah. can have a good time at least you're not meant to um obviously drink on set, but we're not the crew. Yeah. We can have a good time. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. So the first day, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. The second day, we were in the green room for five, six hours. It was an unpaid job as well, run by student filmmakers. So I don't know how they got 
that location to shoot in. And we were there. And you know these essay jobs. There's a lot of small talk that you do. I call yep. it extra talk. What have you done before? Who have you met? And it's okay for the first three hours uh, on the first day. But when it gets to day two, you kind of run out of talking with people and everyone's on the phone. Everyone's just playing whatever game they can have. We're in a green room. There's no Wi-Fi. We've, everyone's done talking with everyone else. Everyone's in a bad mood. And the ADs just aren't telling us what's happening at all. My phone's on about 10%, so I'm already in a bad mood because I, I didn't decide to charge my phone before getting there. I've been on it for four or five hours. Well, they didn't have plug sockets or anything? Uh, they had li- minimal plug, plug sockets, but when there's about 60 people there, right, okay, yeah, everyone's hogging everything. And we were all there just as a favour for these filmmakers. But two days unpaid, I've done worse, you know? Yeah. But I went over to the AD saying, do you know when we'll be filming? because we've had no correspondence from anyone. And he just kind of ignored us and blew us off. I said, okay, I'm leaving. And he pulled me aside saying, you can't leave. I went, of course. And I I picked a few people who I'd sort of befriended there saying, we're just going to have like an exodus. We're going to leave. You can't leave. I said, I've not signed any contract to say that I'm even here. I haven't signed anything. So if there's a fire and you're having to do a checklist of who's there, technically I'm not here. So I'm leaving. So about five of us left, walked out. You see that you see the um I watched it the other day on YouTube. You know, when you go have like a retrospective of what you've done. I just went through because there's so many projects that I've done that yeah. I've not I've not got links, I've not got screenshots, I don't know. So I just searched it. It's on YouTube and you don't see anyone. Anyone who was there, they're not you see like glimpses of faces and it's because they put all these transitions and stuff in, you don't see anything. This so it's is, not the worst essay job because every the worst essay job is probably the next one I do, and then the next one. I, I won't do an essay job for five months, and then I'll go back to it because I'll start to miss it. And within an hour of being there, yeah, and I hear that essay come over and start bragging about who he's met. That's when I check out and go, "Why am I here?" This this is what drives me nuts. I just want to have a quick rant about essay work for a second to you because I know you'll understand. And for those listening, I you know I've spoken about it on live streams before. Okay. I'll quickly say the good things and then we'll get all into the bad things. So the good things are look, you're getting paid money to pretty much stand around. And the setting is the key thing. You know, if you're in a restaurant or if you're in a pub or, you know, like a a sitting with like chairs and it's fairly warm, you're going to have a pretty good time, right? It's going to be all right. Like maybe you're on your phone, maybe you're chatting to people. I normally chat. I like to do that, you know, whatever, like pass the time you're getting paid to do that. That's great. Now, <laughs> when it comes to the bad stuff, it's like, I, I feel like the, the biggest problem with extras work, well, there's two problems. One is, look, for whatever reason, it's not respected and you don't get treated very well. Now, I understand if you've got like 100 people in a crowd scene, you're not really, your job is, yeah, to just kind of fill the background. But that doesn't mean that it's not important because you need people to do that. If I have like a busy city scene, I need people to do that. And you can't have the general public. You just can't. There's legal issues. And also just like people are just too busy staring at the camera. You need actors who know what's like, know not to look at the camera, know what to do and how to interact. And, you know, whether it's like fake interaction where you're miming or whether it's actual conversation, you're keeping your breath down. Like you need actors to do that. Filmmakers, people that are in the industry. And I feel that that gets really overlooked sometimes. And it kind of irritates me because sometimes you'll get extras work where I take me when I was doing Hollyoaks recently or last year, whatever it was, um, there was only like five of us were on screen. We had to act, you know, it's not like, yeah, I might not have had dialogue, but I had to act. I, you know, they were like, listen, we need you to look, you know, intense. Like this is a serious moment. So I'm fucking well acting, you know? And that doesn't get respected. And that irritates me. And another thing that irritates me about it is that, you know, much like any other job, if you do a good job, you keep getting booked. You know, you get like they recognize you doing a good job and you get more jobs because you're reliable. So there's like, uh, how can I put it? There's like a professionalism within that, like any other job. And then agencies, these agencies have the favorites as well. That's oh, of course. Yeah. No, I understand that. Not annoying, but. 
like I say, it's some agencies, there's a one strike policy where if you, if you don't turn up that day, that's it. You're off the books. And oftentimes with those agencies, they're exclusive. So you can only be with them. <laughs> well, get me more work then. <laughs> well, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. I think the exclusivity thing is a little bit cheeky. Like some of them, I don't, I don't, I'm not signed up to them anymore because when I signed with my agent last November, one of the providers was you, you can't be with, which makes sense. But, but like, I'll still like do it on the side and now and again when I can find work and whatnot. But like that always used to bother me when they would say like, oh, you have to be exclusive to us, but then they're not finding you any work. And then, <laughs> and then it's like, <laughs> one thing I found really cheeky is they'd be like, you've been released from this job. You're free to go and do what you want. And I'm thinking, I was always free, mate. I, all I said was I was available. I didn't say the I'm... Day before, the day before shooting, when you, you've not even wrote it in your diary because you say yes to everything that comes. Yeah. You can do what you want with your Friday now. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was literally hanging, waiting on the phone for you. Like, was, you know, like, classic, like, just sitting there, like, looking at the phone going, come on, man. Come on, please, please, please. Eight, eight, eight o'clock, I did a, an essay job yesterday. The day before, the agency get in touch saying, "Will you? Could you provide images of your clothing options?" No, oh, I hate I just this. Put, yes, I just put yes, yeah. And then I get a, a message eight o'clock on the night. Could you send the images over? <laughs> okay, so now everything that I've ironed that's in my bag, I need to take it out, lay it on the floor, take pictures, knowing full well that when the agent gets them, they are not going to send them to the costume department whose job it is to get in touch with me. Well, this is another thing that irritates me. You get, okay, they're big productions. They have a costume department, right? They might not have sizes for everyone, but chances are they've got a big budget. They've got money for that, right? Why are we, the extras, having to bring our own costume in a bag so we have to carry this shit around? We bring it there, and I guarantee they won't fucking use it. <laughs> like, I've seen people bring like full three piece suits and everything, and it's like, yeah, no, we're not going to use that. We're just going to have you in your t shirt. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, oftentimes, what you go with, what you turn up with, is yeah. what they'll. Yeah, you're fine like that. Especially as a guy, if <sighs> yesterday all all the women that were being used, they go in, they get all the makeup done, they'll just look at you and go, yeah, you're fine. We'll take yeah. you off, which is good for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I, I'm happy that, that that that's fine, but now I have to carry this bag around all day, <laughs> which is annoying. Often, oftentimes, I find that it's not the costume department; it's the agent who is yes trying to get perhaps too involved. It's not rocket science. You, your job is to get me on set, and then I will do my work, and the costume department will do their work, and the makeup department will do their work. Everyone's there to work. Your job is just to get me there and then if they approach me saying would are you free i did a job years ago for five days and then the ad came over saying would we would like to use you for the next five days next week absolutely fine that was not them getting in touch with the agent to ask me yeah. that was coming direct to me which is what i like fair, there's no nonsense yeah. with it there's so many things that irritate me about it though like with the costume just for a second like i remember one film i did <laughs> I bought my bag. I've got all this stuff. And they're like, no, 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 no. Didn't you bring this? And I'm thinking, you're the costume department. That's literally your job is to provide costumes. Why do I have to bring a fucking, like, I'm not the costume director. Why do I have to bring like, like how many fucking colored shirts do you think I own? Like, sorry, I just, I just, this irritates unbranded, me. <laughs> unbranded as well. Yeah, well, yeah. Cause it will be like, okay, no patterns. Uh, they have to be this particular colors, this, that. Sometimes I've, I've had to go out and buy the stuff because I just don't own it. <laughs> I just don't like, I don't own that color of a shirt and I had to buy it. And like, that will obviously still be useful, but it's like, what the hell? And they're like, what, you don't own a color of a shirt of this? It's like, no, I don't. I don't own a, I don't know, red, bright red shirt with this on it because I just don't wear bright red shirts with, I tend to wear like more darker colours. That's just me. I don't know, shoot me. But like... You're, you're, you're shooting an advert for Manchester City. Could you bring your favourite football top? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I couldn't actually, no. <laughs> That's just common sense though. Come on, City, yeah. and you turn up in a red shirt. It's like, well... Could... <laughs> yeah, I've got so many unbranded... Because cause I, I don't follow football, yeah. partly because, as you can tell with the accent, I'm from Middlesbrough, so I don't think we're doing too well. 
But when you move to Manchester, everyone appears to follow football because there's mm. a strong divide with City and United. I live in Salford, so they're very much one way. But I've got so much blue in my wardrobe because I've done so many adverts with uh, Man City or uh, teams like that where it's all blue. I've never had to wear red for a football team whose primary colour is red. It's always blue. <laughs> so when they go, is it United or City? City, because I've done about three adverts with them. That's the only reason. Not because of the football, but because they paid me three times, three separate occasions for different adverts over the years. I want to put like a bow on the whole um, extras stuff for a second as far as like the bad experiences. Um, one, uh, maybe you'll find this as well, is like, I feel like the way that you get treated sometimes makes you feel kind of... I don't know. It, it kind of like... order. There's a yeah. pecking order. We always say it as a joke that the supporting actors, not the supporting artists, the supporting actor's shoelace is more important than we are on the set. In terms of the colour of that shoelace, continuity, we're kind of expendable. Yeah. We can be changed around. If it's certainly for one day shoot, they can just swap us. No one's going to know. Yeah. And it, I just feel like it, it sh it shouldn't be that way. Like I understand that, like as you say, we are expendable, but that that that's still you're still part of the production. You're still part of every. Like you still have to be professional. Like you still have to compose yourself in a certain way. And absolutely, uh, but not to, not to interrupt you. But I some I like doing essay work because it's paid, and also a lot of the times I like to have very little responsibility. Sure. On a yeah. Set. I get that. It's not my production. It's not my money that's being spent, which when it comes to the short films that I make, it is my money. So I like to be on set where I see the crew members getting stressed because I know that's not, that's <laughs> nothing to do with me. They're you had to watch the chaos. Because, well, no, but it's, it's quite refreshing knowing that how <laughs> a film sets like, it's like a brick wall, right? Yeah. And if there's a, if there's a, you know, it all has to work. Everyone has to be there to work. Regardless of if you're the essays at the bottom, everything else is built on top of that, right? Or maybe the other way around in terms of this analogy. I don't know where it's going. But I like to be on set because there's no uh, pretensions as an essay. Yes, you have to be professional. But if it all goes wrong, <laughs> I, I just get to go home and not worry about how I'm going to edit around this problem that we had I like to just be there, drink coffee, talk to people, network, uh, go home, and then get paid three months after I've done that job. Speaking of which, like sometimes you get lucky, and like for instance, we'll meet each other, and you know you make good connections, and you make films to go, which we're going to get into a bit later. But like a lot of the time, you meet people, and as you mentioned earlier, there'll be the usual essay talk now. I'm happy to say that like things have sort of progressed to, for me to a stage where I'm not only doing that work now. And uh, listen, I, I don't care. Like it's not an ego thing. Like I'll do essay work. I don't care. Give me the money. Great. That gets me out of having to do like kiosk work. Like <laughs> I'm happy with that. It's it. I see it as money that I look at it for what it is. It's money. It is what it is. But the one thing I've realized is if you're trying to get somewhere in the industry uh, as, let's say as an actor, filmmaker, director, whatever, um, doing extras work. I got about this. It's it's not gonna advance it like in in like the traditional, you know, career ladder style. Like, I mean, it depends how you look at it. Like, are you going to meet people? Yes. And if you're proactive and you talk to people, that's how you're going to make the connections and and really start making moves in the industry. You know, potentially. But actually just doing those gigs, like one by one, is not really going to move it. Like, I've heard of stories here and there. I've had people on the podcast that have said otherwise and have been like, oh, well, actually, I got bumped up to feature or I got, a, I got a, you know, some dialogue or whatever. And that's great. I'm really happy to hear like, when that happens for people. But that's like one in a blue moon. Because I think, think people forget a lot of the time that like your job is to be in the background and not be seen or heard. That's kind of the whole point. And if you get bumped up, it will be because something big has changed because everything has already been cast in the film, the TV series, whatever. So if they like 
randomly give someone a line, it will be because they need it to work for something else. Yeah. It's not like, you're not like suddenly like, oh, now you're the star of the movie. Like, it's not going to happen. No, no. You know I what remember, I mean? <laughs> not, again, not to cut you off, but I told this story yesterday on set. Um, I think 2016 or 17, I was hired for a day on Peaky Blinders, um, which over those years, it seemed that everyone was involved in Peaky <laughs> Blinders uh, in some way. I remember being on there, on season four and the AD came over to all of us saying, there's a few of you that we would like to give a couple of lines of dialogue to. Brilliant. Why? Um, There's the bartender who, there's an actor who was supposed to turn up and play a bartender. And he had some lines of dialogue opposite the, one of the main actresses in the show. I think he had three lines of dialogue and they gave it to me. And I was like, brilliant. And then everyone keeps coming. They'll go, can you do a Birmingham accent? Yes, I I can. Um, Have you done acting training? Yes, yeah, of course. I'll do the line. So all of a sudden, I'm just there with no responsibility. Now I've been given uh, one of the main roles in this scene, at least. Yeah. Three lines of dialogue opposite this actress. Oh, my my heart's going. People are coming over, pumping me up. You're going to be great. You're going to be on TV. There's no way they're going to cut you out, you know? That's a jinx. Uh, I'm there, I'm rehearsing <laughs> the lines, I'm, I'm in the toilets, I'm trying not to drink as much coffee, so I'm not shaking. Um, and then we're getting ready to go on. Brilliant. I'm going to wait for someone to come and get me, one of the ADs. Okay, uh, coming to set is the, the barman. Da, da, da. Five minutes before the cameras started rolling on that scene, the original actor who was playing the bartender, who had got the role through the audition process, turned up. Obviously, he was late, but he turned up. And then they go, all right, Dan, we don't need you now, actually. You can just sit out. Jeez. And then, um, okay. So now I'm in Video Village, where all the ADs and the makeup department are watching and writing notes. There's maybe eight, eight screens from all the different cameras. Watching this actor recite the lines of dialogue that I have been practicing for three, four hours. Oh, of course. Yeah, fuck. And I'm going, oh, no. Like, not that I would have done a better job, because I don't think I would have. But part of you is, you're so pumped for that. Yeah. Like, why would you, this poor essay who's here for whatever I'm here for, you know, why would you try and make it seem like this job was going to entail more than it is? And then I remember a few weeks later being on another job, but it was the same uh, assistant directors. Because often when you do so many essay jobs, you will see the same camera guys, the same... Uh, the same grips, the same lighting guys, because to them it's just a job. Yeah. Not just with those essays, to them it is just a job. There might not be as much passion as, oh, I want to do the cameras this way or the lighting this way. No, it's just a job for them, oftentimes. Unless you've got a visionary director, yeah. oftentimes they're just there to do the job, and they'll do it well. And I remember the AD is coming, you look familiar. Great, thank you. Often it's, oh, you're the guy off uh, Avatar, right? <laughs> you, look like him. Um, you look familiar and then they'll go you were the bartender in Peaky Blinders and then it brings it up again it's like it's like a, a wound that's healed and then you just rip it off I mean it's I think I think at the end of the day we're gonna have those moments where it's like disappointing like I've been in similar situations on on the set and it's kind of crazy how they just push you away like you're nothing you know which makes the when you get to do like a featured thing all the more special do you know what i mean like i remember i can't talk about it right now but there was a music video i did yes last year and i felt that way i felt like wow this is a really big deal and i can't believe i'm doing this and i i couldn't help but think about all those times when i've been on set when you know they just because it feels like they just don't care about you to be honest it feels like you're just you're sitting there watch every, watching everyone else do your dream. And, you, you know, it, the best way I can explain it for for, pe- for maybe people who might not know what, I'm, what the hell I'm talking about is, have you ever been a musician and been watching, you know, artists play on stage and you haven't played in a long time and you're ready and you want to perform, but you can't? Or have you ever been a football player who's sitting on the reserve bench and watching everyone else play and you're ready and you're, you know, you're, you've been training, whatever, and you don't get picked. 
it's like that you know it's just you're ready you know you can do it but you just for whatever reason you just haven't been there just yet haven't given the opportunities man. right that's the way i look at it and but then i think there's an important lesson there i think what it is is to be ready to receive it when you do get it because you will get it and when you do get it, be ready and knock it out of the park and show everyone why you deserve that opportunity. I think that's the key. But I will say that I think sometimes there are people who I've noticed, I won't name names, but there are people, and I'm really proud of them because they keep getting stuff all the time. But it's always SA stuff. And I'm a bit puzzled by what the goal is. Like, okay, if the goal is I just want to do film and TV work and I want to do this as a career, like as in like essay work, nothing wrong with that. Great. Brilliant. As long as you're happy and you're enjoying it, fantastic. But I, I feel like that's not what it is. Like, I feel like just like us, they're trying to get somewhere with it, mm -hmm. but they're not doing, because it's, it's the efforts outside of that that do something. I would, I would love that to be my dream. It's uh, not it's my dream. But I would love to have that level of just being okay with that. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> without, I know what you mean. Without any pretension of trying to be more in the yeah. industry, just to have that as a job, different sets, because I think I know who we're talking about. There's a, there's a few people. And, yeah. and, and, like, again, they're smashing it, and they're really good. And I, I think back to, like, conversations I've had with them where they're really enthusiastic about it. And I'm happy for Often them. Oftentimes as well, they are slightly older than us as well. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's, it's, no, you but know, what I mean is we, maybe because we're both 30, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we predict in 10 years' time we will be doing more than what we're doing. At <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you were doing this at closer to retirement age, even at 45, 50, they're happy with that because it's not the normal job, let's just say that maybe they've been doing for 20 years hmm. and maybe that maybe that's good enough for them i'm just trying to devil's advocate here yeah no no abso we, absolutely we have aspirations beyond that well i think you, you put the nail on the head there like i like yourself would love to be just be like oh yeah this is good enough for me but for whatever reason i just can't like i I need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and anything less than that is going not good enough for me. And maybe I'm just a big old fuss pot. I don't know. But the thing is, I always will give it my absolute best in everything I do, whether it's work in the kiosks at a football club or being on set and, and acting like I'm going to put everything into it. It's just that I feel like I can do so much more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of the time when you're on set and, and you're doing these roles and it's not quite what you want to be doing, you know you can do more. You can, do you know what I'm saying? Like, look, you've been doing this nearly 10 years, nearly 10 years, right? You've done many, many, many projects over the years. I've worked with you and seen how you work. And I'm like, this guy deserves a shot. This guy deserves to go far with this. You know, like, I believe in you. Whether or not you believe in yourself, I believe in you. And I know everyone else that works with you believes in you. And... <sighs> I think I just I, love compliments, Christian. <laughs> I don't get uncomfortable when you talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I mean it, man. I, I think that the, the things that I always pay attention to is how someone composes themselves, how they work. At, and that's kind of what I meant before about the whole essay st stuff. Because, like, it, look, it gets you on set. You're meeting people, you're you're doing stuff. You're do you know what I mean? That's better than doing nothing. But I do think like if you're trying to become like a professional actor, director, writer, whatever, it's more about like, okay, who are the connections I'm making here? What work am I setting up for myself? Or what work am I doing outside? Like I'll give you a really quick example that's been on the show before. Um, Aziz Kamal, he's an actor who was on the show, and he mentioned that he'd spoken to a fellow actor about what they're doing. And they just said that, oh, I'm just doing this. I'm just doing extra, like the extra stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but like, what are you doing outside? Are you auditioning for stuff? Are you doing like, you know, setting up your reels, et cetera, et cetera. And they were like, no, I'm just doing this. And that's what I mean. It's like just doing that is not enough. And I'm, I'm looking at 
the stuff that these these people are doing these friends of ours professional friends and i'm like you need to be doing more of the other stuff like this stuff's great but you need to be doing more of the other stuff so that you can bump it up because you're good it's just you know like or it'll be like they're they're saying like hey check me out i was in this scene and i'm like yeah but like what is this like i want to see more of you acting on screen your face i want that's that's what is going to push you and get you and elevate you you know it for me it's frustrating i i feel like i want to shake them and be like come on man come on like it's refocus we've got this it's not it's, what it is it's not it's not jealousy it's just feeling that if you had the opportunities that they're getting you would be able to do it so much more in terms of what they've been given no, 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 not even that. I mean, I mean more uh, like I'm, I'm puzzled. Like I said, I'm puzzled by what they're doing. I'm like, I feel like, like I said before, the essay work is is great for certain things. I just, I don't know that it's really going to advance your career or push you in the direction you want to be heading in. You know, no. like it's it's. You just have to look at how people in the industry look at it to tell you everything you need to know. Like a I've of, I've had people who are it, sorry a lot of people who are ads. If you are an extra or an SA, that is how they will always perceive you as an SA. Right, right. They'll never yeah. see you beyond that. A casting department won't uh, bump you up for having been on fifty TV series as an ex as an SA. That's not how it works. You know that. Well, it's. I mean, I've literally had people in the industry agents people I've worked with tell me don't talk about extra stuff. If anything, keep it a secret. There's people that joke about it in Hollywood. Like, Oh, it's like a dirty secret. Like I personally, I'll never be ashamed. I work is work. It's we acted, we were on those productions and we did our work and we went home and we got paid for it. It's work. Like I don't understand that mentality. I never will. Um, Some of the best stories that you have, certainly if you're going to talk about them on a podcast, it's not the essay work that you do. They're not the best stories that you have. The best stories are, working with a friend on a film that we made last year, right? They're the stories that you want to tell and not, because I think telling stories about essay work is kind of. It's like war stories, isn't it? It's like being in the trenches and you're kind of like, oh, do you remember when we did this? Or like, oh yeah, it's, and that's how I feel. Like you're all in the same position dealing with this thing and you all kind of know it's a little bit shit, but you're <laughs> in it together. Do you know what I mean? It's like we're in this yeah. together. Like that's how I feel with it. I'm like, and that's what makes it all the more funny when someone's because every now and again there'll be one person that'll come and they'll be like, "Yeah, so I've done this, 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 and this. I was there on this production and on this production." And we're like, "Great, that's brilliant." You know, because you're not you're not going to be shitty about that. You could be like, "Well, fantastic. I'm happy for you," but then they sort of lord it about a bit, and you're like, "Okay." <laughs> But we 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 all know that like this isn't doing anything for our careers. It's it's. Oh, they'll come in. They'll come in on these essay jobs. They'll come in going, yeah, 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 yes, yes. I'm going. <laughs> okay, mate. He's like, yeah, I've just got off the phone with my agent. That's great. And then I'll just, I don't want to ask because I know the what they're waiting is me to go. Oh, what is it? And they go, well, I've just got this walk on job on this production. Good for you, mate. Good for you. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? Like, I feel like it's always it's always going to help your professionalism to be humble about things and just say like, Oh yeah. You know, like if anything, like I, I often will talk things down about, like, Oh yeah, you know, things are all right. You know, whatever. Like, cause I don't want to make other people feel crap. Number one, cause I care about other people's feelings. And also too, like, I just don't think it's very becoming to, to just sort of like, we're all in the same, like, I, I like this idea that a lot of the people that I've met and maybe, I don't know if it's the same for yourself, but a lot of the people I meet, actors, directors, whatever. It feels like a big community of people that are trying to bump each other up and look out for each other because they know how hard it is to book a gig. Like we mentioned at the top of, of the podcast that like January is quite a quiet month for us, you know, and like y it's not like you're not putting the effort in, you're not auditioning, like you're, you're trying as hard as you can, but sometimes there's just not work. I was talking to a lady yesterday who... We were talking about soaps because she really wants to be involved as an essay in soaps. And I was talking about Hollyoaks, and I know a, a few people have bad experiences on Hollyoaks. Really? I've always had good experiences. Yeah, same. Yeah, well, I think surprising. predominantly, if you ask essays, they've only heard the bad things about uh, okay. I could joke about the set and things that have happened, but that would be quite 
unprofessional of me to talk about that, right? But what you have to realize as an SA, you are coming into the workspace of maybe a hundred people who work with each other five days a week and you're only there for one day. So there might be a reason why, because they have such a quick turnaround and you might only be on one day shoot a year, they're not going to remember you because they work with themselves. It's like uh, the job I did yesterday. There's so many people who I've met before on other sets, but they're like a family and you're coming into that family as an SA. So it's like, it's very clicky, you know, you feel like the outsider as an SA because they go through so many people every day. Yesterday, when what we were filming, were, there was maybe only six of us as an SA. What they film next week, there might be, over the course of the week, a hundred people that they go through. But they're working with each other, the camera guys, the lighting, everything. And you're coming into that workspace. So I understand why people kind of, not bad mouth SA work, but why the experience isn't what people expect. Because I encourage people to do SA work. Yeah, no, same. I mean, I, I think it's it's useful. I, I don't want to make it sound like I don't think there's any value in it because absolutely there is. I think people just people have to be reasonable with their expectations. I think that's what I'm trying to push forward. Yeah. It's like it's, yeah. this is not going to lead to you becoming the next lead in a Hollywood movie, right? That's it, it's not. It's just not. But it can be used, and this kind of leads me into the next thing I wanted to talk about with you is that like it can set up beautiful sort of working relationships and we've now worked on i believe two separate productions one of which you led and one of which you were uh, the lead actor in um and that's what i think it's more useful for is is building up that stuff which then will also be useful for other things so for example um the film that we did together ono guano is featured prominently in my showreel right which for those who don't know is like a way of showing an actor's range across several projects and being like, this is why you should hire me. And it's basically like a CV, I guess, a video CV. And so there's that element to it, but then there's also, you know, working together, working on your craft, getting better. It's a new experience. And then it can help, Like nothing, I feel like nothing is ever wasted with stuff like that, you know, but let's talk about this in detail. Ono oh, Guano, what's the kind of, thought process behind this particular film like where did this idea come from i think partly when you're making films yourself self-funded films yourself you want to use people that you know are reliable if there's a specific location in mind certainly uh, there's a lot of times even in feature films they're quite unambitious where they will just have certainly if it's a horror film they'll just have one location I don't like just filming in one location, unless it's a showreel piece where you can really have fun with the writing, the character dynamics between the people. But in terms of an actual short film, I like various different locations. But with Ono Guano, I really have fun writing dialogue. So to be able to mainly have fun visually, because there's no dialogue in Ono Guano, right? Uh, except for the end of the interview. Very except briefly. the end, which is kind of like the epilogue. Um, there's there's no dialogue. Yeah. And it kind of came about because uh, our friend Giuseppe Abba, G, I'll call for short, but I just wanted to throw his name out there. He was at the time, and this is not to badmouth um, who he was working with or the projects that he was doing, but he was a, uh, a filmmaker who was doing a lot of corporate jobs. Yeah. Every time I'd meet him, because I'll go day drinking with him quite often, we would talk about the films we want to be making. And I, I'm, I'm assuming it can be quite demoralizing when all you're doing is corporate shoots, interviews, certainly if you're working with the same clients. Since then, he's gone off and separated because he was working with his friend, um, who then just became his work colleague. So now he's separated and is doing his own thing now. So now he's kind of got that friendly relationship back with who he was working with. And what we wanted to do is just collaborate on a film which was more experimental with a camera, um, having fun with it that way and drawing inspiration from Sam Raimi in particular because we're fans of Evil Dead, we're fans of the Spider-Man films that he did. 
I think it helped. Uh, it certainly helps when it comes to writing films to visualise the influences that you have. And it was always Sam Raimi with this film. And G was on the same page as that. So what we wanted to do is a film which was a bit more experimental, a bit more minimalist with the story. And we could get someone in who was... Because uh, I've never really seen you do comedy before, Christian, I don't think. Light, I've done light every, stuff years ago, but yeah. Every shoot that I've been on, you're very... Partly because you're very well-spoken. I can't say the same about myself. <laughs> I'm from I the North East. I, I think you have a nice accent. Yeah. But I've, I've never really seen you do comedy, but there was a certain atmosphere that you brought that I wanted to get. There was actually a film that I wanted to put you in before that, but logistically, this one was a lot easier. So we yeah. went with Ono Guano. Interesting. Um, how, well, how do you feel like it went? Like, let's talk about because I don't think we've really spoken about that. We spoke about like obviously how it did, and and you know, I like I think we all kind of agree it, it went well, and it was a good good project, and we got a lot out of it. But like, how do you actually feel about it? What, what did you learn from it? I, th I think partly because there was such a gap from the film that I made before that and Ono Guano, it was just good to be making a film of my own again. I was having a lot of fun on set because, like I say, when it's it's a very small crew that we had. There was yourself as the only actor. Um, I was the director. G was the camera guy. And then we had a drone operator one day, Ben, come in. And that was it, really. So it was just kind of... <laughs> Uh, I, I always treat the films that I make, it's not a job. I always say that it's a hobby for me because I think a job often entails getting paid, right? <laughs> All the films that I've made, I've not got paid for any of them. I've spent, you know, I've, I've spent a thousand pounds on a film that didn't even get made. You know, I've, I've thrown money out there. Ono Guano didn't cost that. But there's certain shoots that I've done where we've set off, I've had to get accommodation, hire a generator, lighting, and then a storm hits, and after one camera set up, we called it off. That's a thousand pounds just gone. So in terms of what I've learned, I'm, I'm, I'm basically just happy that it came out the way that it did. Um, Rick Wiltshire, who was the stand-in, um, who was there because I knew you couldn't make one of the days in which we were testing all the mm. camera work and stuff like that. So we did a previs shoot from the storyboards we had. We then developed that into um, as a video with the lenses and going through over one morning with G and with uh, this actor called Rick. And when we were leaving the wetlands, he said, what do you hope to accomplish with this film? And I said, just to get it made. Because <laughs> I, I knew that it would maybe do a few festivals. It would go on YouTube. I think of all the shots that I've made, it's... I've had more correspondence with it because if you go on any of the other shots that I've made, there's maybe one comment, two comments, three comments. There's about 30 comments on that, all praising you because of your fan base. That uh, wasn't all me. It was, there was for, for other, other comments, people celebrating. Comments, it's all from you, Christian. Uh... <laughs> I don't think there's a fan base of mine that subscribed to me, like waiting for my next thing. That's what I'm saying. So I'm glad that the film came out the way that it did and it got a lot of good reactions from people. This is the thing about your filmmaking that like surprises me because like it's there's really good ideas. It's very experimental. I really feel like I know you that you say hey, it's just a hobby for me. It's just fun. And it, it's, it's refreshing to hear like a bit more about that as well, to be honest, like that it's because it's more like it puts less pressure on it rather than it not because like you've been doing it for so long. I have to believe there's part of you that feels like every time you do it, like this might be it. This might be it. There's got to be a part of, of you. the film that projects you. Well, look, when we, when we did that, right. I, I felt like this is mega. This is huge. And it all will like, this is the thing about timing as well. Okay. Like we did that film. It's not boasted our careers. Like, in a huge way suddenly now, but who's to say that won't be in the future? Cause you never know who's watching. You never know who sees certain things. I mean, have a little look at like some of the people I've been in contact with recently. Right. And a lot of that's come from, don't get me wrong from like 
connections, you know, network and stuff like that. But I think a lot of it also comes from the work that you do and who you work with and how you put stuff together. I know there's people clamoring to work with yourself and it's because they've seen your work and they've seen what you're doing and they want to kind of tap into that a bit more. Um, it's good to know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, but like, I do understand the other side of it that it gets like frustrating and Lord knows I have days where I'm like, you know, like what are we doing here? Like I've, I'm pouring everything into this. Why is it not going anywhere? Like I literally did a video the other day about this, but like, I feel like it's so important that we keep going because so many people do give up and that's the reality. Like people would do this sometimes years and years and years and years and then decide to give up. And it's like, you can't give up. You have to keep going because there will be that moment when it pays off, you know? Of course. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like another element to this as well is that we, we have a very similar um, work situation. So like most people I know that are doing this will have like a, a permanent job. Like I have a friend called James who like works the bar somewhere like permanently. Mm -hmm. He's an actor, but he, you know, works there. And I've done that. I've had like bar jobs here and there, hotel jobs, whatever. Right now I've taken the full plunge and I do like agency work. So basically, mm -hmm. technically I'm unemployed. If you want to, I mean, I am employed, but like, you know, like I'm yeah. relying on acting, voice acting, online stuff and then this hospitality work like yourself you're doing that so you can keep yourself free for projects and this is this is how i know this is how i know that you're fully committed like i know i know you'll say oh no it's just a hobby no it's not you you know as well as i do have a normal job <laughs> what? Uh, okay let's 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 be real right if tomorrow you turn around and you were like yeah I'm done. And then you just got like a nine to five. I'd be like, all right, fair enough. He's, he's put it to bed, but you're not, you're still chasing it. And I believe that's because you know, as well as I do that you've got something to offer and that all it takes is the right people to see that. And then it's going to go somewhere. Absolutely. It, it's fun as well. Cause you never know what will happen. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Maybe after this podcast an, an email will come through for a job for five days next week. Absolutely. I'll do it. You never know what's around the corner. But a lot of times it's in other people's hands. Certainly if it's an SA job, it's up to, number one, if there's a production shooting local, if the agent will then get to you and if you fill that criteria that they're looking for. Yeah. A lot of times, certainly with yourself, you're sending headshots out, you're doing self-tape auditions. You might not even get any, any co correspondence from that. That's the standard, yeah. I did, I, did, <laughs> I did one last week. I did one last week. I went out. I dropped uh, my girlfriend off at work. Um, it was a, a film partly influenced by Drive, the Ryan Ooh. Gosling film. I'd love to be in something like that, especially now that I do drive. <laughs> <laughs> this time last month, I didn't have a car. I only got a license in November. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to be qualified for these things, right? The, the role's called the driver. I can drive. I'll go for it. So we left. I dropped Zoe off at work, and she was filming me in the car, changing gear, driving oh, cool. work. It was about half six in the morning, so it looked quite noirish. I did it. I spent a couple of hours editing it, putting some things on, reading the lines at home. I've not heard anything back, but that's often the case. You don't hear watch anything. Him, watch him get the role next, like tomorrow. Like. <laughs> it's and then I go, Christian, you have to take that bit out the out the podcast, man. Ah. But, that, but that's that's what happens, you know. That's always what happens. Do you, oh, just on a complete side note, by the way, because you mentioned there that you're filming, like you going into a car, stuff like that. Do you often, when you're out and about, just like film like B roll of stuff to no. be used later? I don't, no. I, I haven't got a good enough camera for that. <laughs> I know people who do. I know people who um, have really high quality drones and they'll go out on walks and film B roll, like stock footage that they can yeah. sell on stuff like Pond 5 because. With Ono Guano, all the shots of the birds, I didn't film any of that. Really? That's all stock footage that I have to go in frame by frame to um, remove the bird to put on footage that we have shot. Interesting. Um, okay. So if you, that, that's the reason why it was a dove. I wanted it to be a pigeon. There's not a lot of stock footage of pigeons flying. There's a lot of stock footage of doves flying. So we'll just change it to a dove. I love that. It's one of those sea, cases where a sea of, of it's a flock of doves. 
<laughs> How often do you get harassed by a flock of doves? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I know a guy who owns a, a par- like a macaw parrot. Cool. So part of me was thinking, we'll just use that. <laughs> oh, that would have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you use what you have access to. That's the thing. Similar to why I made Ono Guano. I knew you were capable of something like that. And the location is a five minute walk in that direction. I really appreciate the opportunity, man. Thank you so much. There'll be more. There'll be more, of course. I hope so, man. I really would love to work together again. Um, The second time we got to work together was interesting because now I was working alongside you as an actor. So we were in this film called Choc Chips together. As of recording, it's not out. I I think it'll probably come out sometime this year. Don't text Uh, G. Don't text G. Let him edit it. Just let him edit it. I won't say it. I, was saying, I just my, my thing is that you record this stuff because there'll always be things I've worked on. And I'm sure you have the same thing. You've you've done it, and then you just don't hear anything for ages, and you forget about it, and then eventually it's like, oh hey, this is out, and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm going through. I'm going through the because when I look at, I sent you a few notes the other day because I know if you look on my IMDb, mm-hmm. there's a lot that's missing. If you look on my star now, there's a lot that's missing. But on my, la- on my computer, there's a file of everything that I've done. And I think when I counted them, there's about 160 things that I've done over nine years, right? And a lot of them I'm reading going, what is that? And I'm, there's no evidence of it out there. I'm going, what is that? And then I'll be in bed and I'll go, oh, it's the film that I did yeah. with Gene abandoned all those years ago. He didn't finish it. That's what that is. Jeez and there's a student film that I'm doing. Where I was an extra in a bar for the student film. I can't remember that film. And then all of a sudden it'll come to me. Oh, yes, it was this one where this happened. And oh, that's an interesting story. But you have so many that unless you go back, you forget. <laughs> I have the same problem as well. Like I sometimes there'll be something where I I recorded something and they're just taking a really long time to put it together. And then they reach back to me and they're like, hey, uh, so we need you to do some lines for this. And I'm like, who are you? What? Uh, and I have to start Googling that or like looking in their name and the emails. I'm like, oh. And then if it's a voice acted thing, I have to like sit and listen to my own lines and relearn the voice again and then go from there. Christian, I did a film, I think 2017 or 2018, a student film. And then I messaged maybe a month later one of the producers saying, oh, he's he's left the country with all the footage, the director. I went, what? I went, yeah, I think he faked his own death and left the country. I was going, I wasn't that bad in it, was I? But yeah, just to have to fake your own death and just take all the footage. I think he lives in like Thailand now or something. But That's it bad. was one of those cases where we didn't hear anything and I thought I was quite good in it. So I messaged the producer saying, any word from this uh, this film that we did? Oh, we we've not heard from him in however long. I have a I have a similar story he left, where he just left with everything. He left uni. He left his house, and he just fled. Oh, mad! Wow, huh? It's probably like a drug mule or something. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. There was a film that I did, and it had like a big budget, and the director was an asshole, and it's a long story, but like. I remember... Christopher Nolan's not an arsehole. Sorry? Christopher Nolan's not an arsehole. No, it wasn't him. He was, he was a sweetheart. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure he remembers me very well. <laughs> um, no, nah, there, was, there was a film that I did, and the director was just very rude and blunt to people on set, which, yeah, it's not the end of the world, but it, it kind of did suck to see that. And I, I remember like calling him out on it one time, and he just kind of walked away, and I was like... <laughs> All right, fine. Um, but then fast forward to like years later, he's like finally releasing it online or is, is trying to like promote it. And I'm like, great. Uh, when can I see it? And he's like, it will be out. It will be out. I was like, great. Looking forward to it. Um, I promote it as well on my socials. And then he has a go at me because one of my images was crop cropped so i uh, dropped some names out so he's like lecturing me on like we need to give credence or like acknowledgements to everyone and i'm like dude i know how filmmaking and tv works i know that there's like a big crew of people that make it happen like and i'm proud of everyone that worked on it we smashed it when can i see the film and he just he just he was after being rude to me he was like yeah, yeah, yeah you'll see it you'll see it and then it just never got released 
or whatever. All I've seen is some stills, a very short teaser trailer, but like he's just not released it. And I'm like, why wouldn't you release it? So my only thought is that maybe it was just so bad that he's like ashamed of it. But like, I don't know, visually, it looks great. I don't know. So, but well, I don't... when sorry, when we we had a screening of was it on Guano? I think it was at Gulliver's last year, and we screened. Ono Guano, and then a film that I made, a horror film called In the Dead of Night. I love that, yeah. Where it goes from day to night. Now, that was basically a film with a three-act structure. And in September or October, I had filmed back-to-back the first two acts of the thing. Because for people listening, it's a film in which someone gets stalked by a creature who is only there at night, and it cuts from day to night, when it's at night, the creature's there. When it's day, it's not. We basically filmed it so that seamlessly it cuts from day to night. So the first day at night, we were having to film the scenes, me running, me whatever I'm doing. And then we had to basically do it with the same camera setup, me in the same position the next morning. And then in the edit, it comes together day to night. So it's like one long sequence. This was a film that we shot in September or October. Fast forward six, seven months later, I've not even finished shooting that film. It's just there. And Rick, who I mentioned earlier, was the creature in that film. And he came to the screening of Surprise, which was a, a feature film that we made that was released late 2018. And I said at the time of filming that in the dead of night would be kind of like a a part of that. It would be like a in the dead of night and then now your feature presentation, this other film that we made, this feature film. He came along. I think he was a bit disappointed that the film, because he was involved in Surprise as an, as an extra, but he also wanted to see this film going from day to night. We hadn't even filmed it yet. Five mm. months into the year, the next year, we hadn't filmed it yet. And I remember just going through all the files that I have, I have maybe 15 scripts that are ready to go. And I'm still writing ones now. I should just film the ones that I have ready. We were meant to film one this month with G and I've just kind of called that a day. I think partly because the actress is moving to Los Angeles for three years. Wow. <laughs> I can always recast, but at the same time, it's a bit of a spanner and that's all it takes for me. It's ah, the amount of times I've met G for talking about a film that we're going to shoot next month. And it doesn't happen. There must be five within the last three years. Do you get and like I found I found all this footage edited of the day to night shoot. And I just messaged uh, my friend Dave, Dave Green, Bolton filmmaker who made Surprise with me. Basically saying, I have the first two acts of this film. Would you help me with the closing of it? Which is why he then stepped in as the creature. He's about a foot and a half shorter than Rick was. Um, but we did it just so then I could release it because it's not doing anything on my hard drive. No one's seeing it. It's just getting, you know, digital dust or whatever. So I'd rather just put it out there, even if it's as part of a showreel that I did, just to get the footage out there because I don't like to film something that doesn't get used. Yeah, if same, same. If it's worth it. And I think that film was quite good. And the correspondence I got from screening that film in the dead of night was quite good. Because last year was the first time I screened it. It's excellent. And it was Halloween time, so I think that's kind of why I intentionally submitted it for that festival. Have you released it on YouTube yet? It was on YouTube as soon as I finished it, yeah. Wicked, yeah. Make sure that's everybody... All, all the films that I do, just it's they just go on YouTube and then I move on to the next one. Make sure everybody goes and checks it out. In the Dead of Night on YouTube. Dan McGee on YouTube. I'll make sure to uh, to make that visual it's, it was brilliant we all loved it like because we all watched it at the screening of ono guano and we we're like this is fucking brilliant like <laughs> it was a great idea like i'd never really seen anything like that it was quite ambitious and it was really well done because there's like different ways you could have approached that but it was like very like like that like it was experimental wasn't it it was it was a high concept horror similar to lights out where mm-hmm. uh, I hadn't actually seen Lights Out when it came to making that film. Since then, I have, because it's one of the most... 
it, it's one of those films which really bumped up the filmmaker. He made a short horror film. And then, since then, in the industry, it's like the guy who made Paranormal Activity. Yeah. He made one film and then his name's on everything now. He doesn't, he's not involved in them. A script will come his way. Yep. Oh. And then from the makers of Paranormal Activity, he's not involved in that. I couldn't imagine That's not what? being involved in the projects that have my name on. I, oh, I don't know about that. Is it executive producer credit? Someone who just <laughs> put your name on it? Yeah, from the maker of one of the most successful horror films of all Dave, time. Dave, David, that's kind of the same as like saying that you have an honorary doctorate from a uni. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's <laughs> like a person. It does, but <laughs> but don't forget if you put from the making of from the makers of this film and you're trying to get funding, right? Funding, they'll know that this film <laughs> cost twenty thousand dollars back in two thousand nine made 150 million dollars that's what that's why so many people make horror films because they're very easy to market they're very marketable and they know they're going to make a profit you look at the recent winnie the pooh film right winnie the pooh blood and honey i know a lot of people involved in the making of those films i'd love to be in one of those films i'd love to be in one of those films you would you want to do horror let's do it <laughs> Let's go. I actually, I actually shooting, know one of the, the actresses. Shooting Bambi now, the shooting Bambi, the reckoning now. Let's go and do it. Let's just turn up the set and go. Let's do it. I would love. Yeah, I'd love to do a horror movie. Um, <laughs> I just, I just. Oh my god! It, it it kind of reminds me of how everything is going in public domain now. Like I've seen on YouTube, they're all people are posting the Steamboat Willie video and just being like, "Oh, check out this crazy new animation." Of course, everyone can do that now, and there's no worry about getting sued because it's purely in the public domain. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, well, the thing is, that's that's jumping on a, a fan base, right? That's jumping sure. on an established IP that, like I yeah. say, quick turnaround on these films, they're going to make a profit. Brilliant. I um, think that's why that's why I made in the Dead of Night and the feature film Surprise because I was I was mainly doing comedies before that. If you look at the films that I was doing at university. And after that, they were all comedies because I figured regardless of the quality of the filmmaking or the acting, if the audience is laughing, whether it be at the film or with the film, it's a comedy, at least they're laughing. The thing with horror, it's the antithesis of that, right? Everything has to work. The mise-en-scene, as they say, has to work because you're trying to frighten the audience and that's quite hard. It's all good just having something go blah to the camera and everyone jumps, but that's not... That's not what horror is. So that's why I wanted to get into horror and why since that I've kind of stuck mainly to horror in terms of the films that I've made. What does this year look like for you as far as what you're planning to do? I would like... Every year that passes, I would certainly like to make a film of my own. I would... I'm meeting, not a feature no we did we did a feature before and that was maybe three years of work Oof. there was a short film could be four or five months of work you know yeah. i'd love to do a feature but that feature was self-funded um with myself and dave green and i think over the years it was about maybe ten thousand pounds that we spent on it which for a, for a film budget is very small mm. but when it's out of your own pocket and you're having to just do normal jobs, essay jobs, in yeah. order to pay other people, accommodation, travel, whatever it is. Um, so in terms of this year, it, it's January. It's quite up in the air. I'd like to have an answer of this is the film I want to go in production of. We were meant to shoot this one that is kind of cancelled or on hiatus for the time being. I would love to finish that because I think it's the best short film script that I've ever done in terms of being like a whole piece. I would love to do that. On the board, there's about one, two, three, six. I don't think you can see. There's yeah. six films there that I would love to finish writing this year. So I think for this year, what I would like is to have the script for a feature, which I can then get out there. And then it's someone else's responsibility. Because over the years, I've found I don't often have that much fun on my own film sets. Even surprised when I was making this film, I wasn't having... When I look back, I was, but I think there was so much weight on this project that I was having, I came into it perhaps with 
higher expectations than what I got. And I was perhaps being a bit more pretentious with some of the things we were doing, you know, whereas now I kind of know my place. A lot of the work that I like doing as a creative is it's happened before the cameras start rolling. It's the writing, it's the research, it's the location scouting, it's getting the actors together. Um, it's storyboarding the project. That's what I have more fun with because I can be myself. I can, I can be home. I can do all that work. So all the work I've done is before we even get to set. And that's what I think I enjoy more of and perhaps what I think I'm better at than actually being on set. Because this feature film that we did, Surprise, there was I was co-creator with Dave Green. We were both credited as writing the film and directing the film. Dave loves working with the crew. He loves... because. At the start of the project, I was being too ambitious with some of the camera work. I remember the first or second day of the first chapter of the film, because it's an anthology film, I spent about an hour and a half trying to block this specific shot. It was like a, it was a tracking shot. It lasted about 30 seconds of screen time. And it was following this character. And as she comes into frame, there's something in the background. It's backlit, there's smoke. And every time it's off camera, it's getting closer until oh, it's not that. there. And then instantaneously, something falls into frame. Um, I think it was a, a decoration, a Halloween decoration. And it was very specifically blocked out. And we spent an hour and a half of our time at this location doing it. When we edited the film, because myself and Dave edited the film, we used maybe 10 seconds of that shot. So it seemed like we were wasting an hour and a half for 10 seconds of footage because I was being too ambitious with it. Fast forward the following year, we'd already been on this production for maybe 10 days, 12 days, over 18 months. He is, we've, we've managed to adapt where I'm, I work better with the actors and he works better with the crew. And we didn't discuss that. It's just naturally how it progressed. He would go towards directing where he wants the sound coming from, even though the sound guy we had was fantastic. That's his job to know where it's best to record it. He was directing Pete, our camera guy, or Matt, who was involved on the second chapter where I was working with the actors because as someone who's acted, I like to be involved in that, even if I'm not on camera. You know what's interesting as well, like hearing you talk about that is because I'm having a similar thing right now work because this is all for me is like figuring things out do you know what i mean like i know i want to be an actor a voice actor i don't i know that that's set in stone but one thing i'm realizing about myself is that i'm really interested in like the setup and creation of things and like for instance i did a table read for a film the other day and I'm throwing ideas forward. I'm like, we could try this. What about this? What about that? And everything from the cinematography to the storyline to that, that, everything. And then I'm starting to realize like, oh, but you know, I'm just an actor in this piece, Yeah. but that's okay because maybe this is the beginnings of something else in the future. And as you said, it's like, you realize about yourself, maybe what you're interested in. Like for me, like I want to do acting and voice acting. I want to do all of that. But I think there might be a career maybe in directing in the future for me more because of what I'm drawn to. Like, uh, same as yourself, like I'm not as fussed about being in front of the camera. I just want to be part of this filmmaking process. And I love directing other people as well. I love like and seeing the vision unfold and everything kind of come together is like, oh, wow. And it's it's interesting because like you can be involved in all these different things like yourself, acting, filmmaking, directing, writing. But you you pick out things that are like, yeah, this is more where i'm effective this is more where i'm useful like for instance i suck at writing i i can sort of do it but i'm i just get a bit bored to be honest you know like i can do like poetry or songwriting but like when it comes to like putting a story together that's a big thing that takes commitment and it's like we all have these things that we're kind of more drawn to and it sounds to me like you're having a similar thing there where it's like you're realizing that okay, this is the this is where it really comes together. This particular role. It's not only that. There's a lot of things that's happened personally in my family's life the last two months. So what you have to do is prioritize your time. Yeah. With industry, I forget that it's a collaborative industry. Mm. I forget that, which is why I put so much 
weight on the shoulders of the productions that I'm doing, thinking that it's all down to me. It's not. It's not at all. I'll hire Giuseppe because he's got a fantastic eye for detail and he's got a decent camera. The fact that he's got a good camera is secondary to the fact that I like working with him. Right. I don't just hire him for the equipment. It's everything, the fact that I can run off. I remember filming Guano. I left something at home. So I had to <laughs> run back, just let you film for 20 minutes, knowing that G was capable of doing that as someone who's directed quite a lot of things himself. But it's the same thing with acting as well, because I've not, I've not gone to a, a drama class. I've done acting workshops, but I've never been to drama school. Everything that I've done is just being on set. Yeah. It's uh, possibly collaborating with people, but Succession. I don't know if you've seen the series Succession. I've not. I've heard a lot about it, though. So Jeremy Strong, in that, a lot of people had trouble with the way in which he would act and behave on set. And it it was only until he said how he his method of acting, which is when it clicked for me, because it is collaborative. But I always treat it as you're there at home, you're rehearsing your lines, this is how I'm going to do it. And I approach acting on set like it's a boxing match, hmm. where I will come on set, I'll give you all I've got, and then when they yell cut, that's me going back to the corner. The director will come, give me pointers, and I will come back in. Whereas everyone else involved in that show Sarah Snook, um, Kieran Culkin, they treat it like a dance. So it's acting, reacting, that's the way it should be. But I've realised that I've been coming into it like it's a boxing match, partly because of the roles that I made play. When we did Chock Chips, the character I'm playing is this Tony Tense. Soprano guy. So for that, it works. It kind of works like that. But it also should be a dance, and that's what I think I need to own the craft of acting. I need to kind of find what I'm good at because it's all well and good saying you can do all these parts, but I forget all the time because the work I like doing comes before the cameras start rolling when I don't have to bounce ideas off anyone else. I can just do it myself. And I think I've been approaching acting the same way and it's not worked for everything that I've done. You picked, you picked on something really, really important there as well. Like you talk about like the collaborative approach and like how that's a big part of it. Like, I feel like with certain people, they're just not interested in that. It's like, come here, do your job. And that's fine. It is, I get it. Like, especially if someone is leading this, you do what they say, right? But I always feel I get a lot more out of myself and out of the experience itself when you can collaborate. Like you mentioned on Onoguano, like me and G were having time of our lives just running around like, what if we would try this? What about this? We could try this. And we were trying to like, logistically figure out certain things we were also because there's another thing as well you have all these ideas but does it work for the story is it um actually useful you know like there's all these things that you learn through the collaborative process and i think that's one of the most fun aspects of filmmaking is getting to do that like working with people bouncing off each other and creating these things mm -hmm. you know and like when that's not there i feel i feel like it's less fun like as you mentioned, like sometimes it will just be like showing up, doing a job and yeah, like every actor has their process and it can be effective, but sometimes you do have to go outside of that to get more out of yourself. Like for instance, um, me and comedy, like I can do comedy, but it's not like something I'd feel that comes naturally to me. It's something that I have to kind of step out of my comfort zone to do. But that's good. That's that's how you become a better actor. That's how you get more versatility and, and you, you get more out of yourself. And I think it's like, that's the key, isn't it? Is is really just trying to like get the most out of yourself and, and grow as a filmmaker. And, and that ultimately is going to lead to you creating your best work, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all compromise, especially in low budget filmmaking. You don't have the budget to do that shot. You don't have... It's not that you don't have the vision, but you, you physically can't do it because you need all this equipment. You know, you go on a film set, there's 50 people. 80% of them are just sat around doing nothing on these big budget shoots, right? Because a lot of their work involves, you know, there's a crew of 10 people to work the smoke machine. Yeah. When the smoke machine's running, they don't need to do anything. 
I kind of, I kind of love that though. That is hilarious that they just do nothing. Like, <laughs> I mean, but they are waiting. For st- I get it. You, 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 you're on hold almost. That's probably the best way to put it. Or on, on call, yeah. on call, or yeah, waiting for your moment. And that's that's the thing I sometimes I hate about acting. It's like, you know, your scene might be like the main thing that they're doing that day, but it might take nine hours to get to that point, and you might be like knackered, tired, fed up by that point. But you've got to go in there and perform. And that can be hard to really to to do that. And I think that it takes its toll on you. Like no matter what part of the production you are, whether it's filming, you know, sound work, lighting, like it's tiring just being there and just waiting, waiting and set resetting up stuff and da 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 da. But then that's the thing, isn't it? Like if you love what you're doing, you kind of ignore how it's making you feel. Like when I think about acting and filmmaking. I've had bad experiences, but I still had a good time. Do you know what I mean? Like, I still love it. And I think that's why it's like, I know this is what I want to do. Because like, w- like, for instance, when I go and work tonight and I do hospitality, I'll be there. It'll be me, but my heart's not in it. But my heart's always in this. Uh-huh. You know well, that's when you know you're going to get somewhere, Christian. That's the thing. <laughs> we'll see, you know, I guess. But... It's not the mindset. You no, know, but, you know... <sighs> How long have you been doing this? This is year five. Year five, right, okay. But I would say, to your point about what you said earlier, where it's like you have that official point where it like really starts happening, I'd say only a few years, to be honest. Like around 2021, 2022 is where I was like, right, we're getting serious, we're putting the... Like last year was a setup year. I, I got a lot of, you know, I got on Spotlight, got signed, show reels, all this. I'm like, right, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this properly by the book. And yeah. we're going to see where it takes us. See, I don't, I don't have Spotlight. I don't have outside of extras agencies. I don't have an agent, which is kind of what I like. I used to just apply for jobs on Star Now before it signed with Backstage. Mm. And it wasn't the jobs that were on Star Now, but it's the people you meet on those jobs. Yeah. Which is where it develops. I remember within the first two months applying for a job for a zombie experience, you know, these haunted houses, airsoft companies, you have to pretend to be a scientist. Then the lights go out and all of a sudden you're a zombie now. Everyone's got guns and they're shooting you with airsoft things. You come away covered in fake blood, sawdust and bruises everywhere. And then I went just for the meeting saying, would you like to be involved in this? Have you done any stunt work before? Yes, I used to be, I used to do professional wrestling. Okay, so we'll get you for that. Perfect. When I'm talking to him, he's going, where would you like to progress in the industry? First time meeting the guy. I would love to be involved in filming. This was my first year doing it, two months in. Oh, we've actually got a Robert Rodriguez associated producer involved in this film that's shooting on the outskirts of Manchester in a month and a half. Would you be interested in that? I didn't apply for that job. I just went uh, with the idea that I would be working as this zombie actor, right? This scare actor. And then the next thing I know, I'm going to be involved as a third AD for this fairly high budget action zombie film that's shooting in Manchester, shooting in Glasgow. They're going to pay me to go out there train 80 people how to act like a zombie when you shot how to fall brilliant that wasn't on star now that was just knowing the right people and that's what i mean when it's a collaborative industry you'd like something to happen where if i know a lot of people who have took off in the industry but they have no power when it comes to casting people yeah we did a ono guano was screened at a fairly high profile film festival in manchester last year jason wingard who was a film director he'd done a few indie feature films now is involved in directing episodes of coronation street oh wow nothing wrong with that it's a very steady job Mm. he's quite a high profile director to be doing that but the amount of people who were wanting to talk to him and (laughs) thinking that he was going to go i like this actor i will put them in a recurring on coronation street he came out at the start of the presentation saying, I have no say in who gets cast, so don't approach me with that. He said it in a very professional manner, <laughs> yeah. but you could tell that's what he was saying. 
I get it, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, th I think that's a, another element to it as well. Like when I talk to people, I don't expect anything. I think I just talk to people. Like when I was on Hollyoaks, I was talking to um, uh, John Sutton and uh, James Sutton. Is it James Sutton? Plays John Paul. Um, great guy. Really nice. Like was very forthcoming with with advice and just just very friendly i was i was the whole experience was like really kind of surreal but it was just nice like i didn't feel anything other than just like nice experience but like when i would talk to him like i wasn't thinking like oh if i talk to him i can get this out of him or that out of him i just looked at him as like we're working together i can ask him stuff and he was more than willing to do so and now that's a contact like every now and again i might drop him a message about something but like i don't like I don't expect that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I, I feel like you can you can you can feel when people are doing that. Um, like another example, um, I just had professional voice actor John Bailey on the podcast. Oh, that and one. I saw that one. It was, cra it was <laughs> crazy. When the podcast started, I heard obviously the honest trailer's voice, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going, wow, he, he got he got this guy to do um his intro. I was like, wow. <laughs> Not realizing that he was John Bradley, John Bailey. John Bailey. John Bailey. Yeah, John Barry, and then all of a sudden he's on there going, "I know that guy" because he's involved in the Nostalgia Critic and other online content. I was like, "Wow, amazing!" But you were saying, "Yeah, sorry." Yeah, well, no, I mean it was amazing. Um, yeah, that's a hero of mine, so I was, I was like blown away by that. But I was also thinking about it from the perspective of this is a guy, and if you watch that show and you and you like, and I recommend everyone go check it out, right? But if you watch it, you'll see a guy that's doing exactly the same thing that me and you are doing. He's at the top of his industry. He's doing really well, but he still has to send about a thousand self tapes every single day and, and use every project that he's doing to help him set up for the next thing. I'll be like, Hey, I've done, I've worked for Marvel for, for this, I've for that, I've done Transformers. Please give me a job. Like he has to do the same thing that we do. And it's the same process. It's the same yeah, process. You want to sit with Sean Bean and you look over and he's just got his script and he's walking back and forth talking to himself with the lines. That's what he's doing. It's Sean Bean. Basis the bloke. Boromir. But that's how you do it. That's how, regardless of how professional you are, or whether you're just very low in the industry, it's the same thing. You have to put the work in. That's all it is. I, I really do feel like if you if you break it down like that and you and you carry yourself with professionalism and you just keep going, it it will work out. But it's 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 you have to be prepared for those rejections, the disheartening feelings, the frustrations, and everything involved with it. But keep going and keep pushing with your vision. Like yeah. one thing I like about your approach is it's I feel it's quite old school, but I love that because I want to see more of that. I feel like filmmakers right now they're not taking enough risks, and okay. it, like, as in like visually and like do, yeah. you know what I'm saying. Like it's there's not much. You like, for instance, we're both fans of Edgar Wright, and he was quite experimental with with how he would shot things up and how he would tell a story. And it's like it was refreshing to work with you and and have that kind of approach to things. You know, I was like, this is this is fun. This is when it's fun, and I feel like it's more fun for the viewer as well mm -hmm. because it's you're you're trying to do something different. You're not doing what everyone else is doing, or what you know is just definitely going to please everyone. You're doing something that's risky, but that's where the interesting stuff is. That's where you, you, you know, every now and every now and again, it's always the same in the industry. Every sort of five years, someone tries something different, you know, like right now, uh, everyone's going on about this um, salt burn, right? It's cut, cut, like, outrageous, a bit crazy, but do you know what? I was thinking about it and I was like, it's getting people talking. It's getting, it's getting people's interest. And yeah, there's <laughs> kind of nefarious reasons for why that's the case, but Still, it's it's ambitious. It's doing something different. No one else is doing that, no. and that's that's what I look at. Like when you meet people in the industry, you're working with people. They've got their own processes, the way they do things. Like one thing, I know we joked about it, but like when I was on set with you, and I was like, "What if we try this? What if we try that?" And you sort of jokingly said, "Like, yeah, just just do your job." Like I, I, I'm the director here, right? But. I'm Did not I, gonna, say, I didn't say it like that. Nah, we, we were, you know, it was like tug and cheek. We were having a fun uh -huh. drink afterwards and we were talking about like, because that's the thing about me. I will say what I think. 
Mm -hmm. And I know that can rob people the wrong way, like in the sense that like, but I'm not going to change who I am. I'm going to do that. And I think that's important to stick to that. It's very easy to let other people kind of come in and, and prevent you from, from doing you or being like, Oh yeah, I should probably just, you know, toe the line, do my thing. No, no, fuck that. Be you. And if it rubs people the wrong way, then it's going to rub people the wrong way. But it's as long as you're doing what's true to you, that's what's going to help you stick out and get somewhere with it potentially. Mm -hmm. Gosh. Anyway, Going back to the audition process, because I was thinking about this. Th th what you need to do is just completely forget about it. When I get back, if I've got the sides of the character, I'll delete the sides of my laptop and I won't even think about it because that's when you start doubting yourself. Maybe if I said this this way, maybe if I acted like that, you start to doubt what you've done. If you've ever been in an audition scenario when you're in a waiting room with 20 other actors, Remember, you don't have to be the best actor in that room. You just have to fit the character and what they're looking for. Yep. That's all it is. You don't have to compete with these actors. You just have to bring something different to whatever role it is that you're auditioning for. Right? I think as well, and I remember, I can't remember exactly how he said it, but Brian Cranston said something on this issue and he summed it up quite well. I'll try to paraphrase what he said, but basically... You go in there with a particular idea of what you want for the character, right? And they might be looking for that specific thing, and you're maybe completely off the mark, but you've gone in there with your idea based on what you thought works for the character. Like I, like I got rejected for something the other day, and they were gracious enough to reach out to me and be like, hey, we're going to go a different direction, but we enjoyed your interpretation. And I looked at that, and I was like, that's great. They saw merit in what I was doing, but they're thinking about something else. And I think a lot of young actors, they forget about this. You didn't get rejected because you're not a good actor. You got rejected because you don't fit the part because they have a particular, like maybe it, it could even, sometimes it's not even about the acting. It's like, oh, they just don't look how I, because remember like the director or the writer's got this particular vision in their head. You know, like for instance, when you chose me for Ono Guano, like, yeah, there might have been, it might have been somewhat to do with my acting, but I think it was probably like, you're thinking like, okay, if I'm visualizing this in my head, how do I see this actor? Like, okay, so Christian can do the, the mannerisms. We want to go that kind of slapstick thing, you know, and who do I know that can do that? Like, it's, you, you think about these things, like, what are the tools I need to make my dream come alive? This person has it, this person doesn't. But obviously, because it's such a industry based upon like looks and all this other shit, like it's and look, I see for it, it is what it is. I try to focus on, on me and what I'm doing and just try to ignore all that. But I know it's there. I know that that's, you know, like I know that, for instance, there's a certain way that people see me and, and what I can do. And I ignore that because I know what I can do and I know I'm just going to keep pushing for that. But you do have to kind of prove it you have to prove it as well yeah uh, go back to it's all well and good saying you don't want to be typecast but you have to break that barrier and go beyond that well, Brian, Brian Cranston I think I do. think did it best like it, before he did Breaking Bad he was that lovable funny father, right? father figure he literally had to like I, I like to I like to think that he took that character and just killed it on screen in front of us. Because <laughs> like, that's kind of what, if you think about it, if you watch the beginning of Breaking Bad, he's he's basically Hal, but then he just <laughs> systematically destroys yeah, Hal and creates eyes of him. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a strange turn. But you have to do it. Like, I look at, like, Daniel Radcliffe, and I know he's desperately trying to do that. And he you know will what? do it, because he's a brilliant actor, and eventually there's going to be a role where it's like, oh, my God, he's this guy. But people, st it's still too early day. And I love him. I, I have a bit of a controversial opinion in that. I think he sucked in Harry Potter, but he's been brilliant in everything else since. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. we're not, he didn't suck in Harry Potter. He was fine. Well, but it, Take a look at Robert Pattinson. Bleh. Twilight. Twilight films. Since then, every Batman. career choice he's made is an improvement just to get away from that. And he didn't do what the Disney people tend to do when like Miley Cyrus tries to break out of that look and goes right. so controversial. Yeah. It felt the way in which Robert Pattinson um, does it is quite organic. Yeah. He made a lot of indie films after the success of Twilight, which people didn't even see. People don't talk about The Rover or Cosmopolis or all these films 
fantastic directors he's working with, but the fan base from Twilight didn't follow him. Whereas, which is, I think, better for him, because you look at the box office figures of the films he made after Twilight, unless it's a romantic film, then no one was interested, which is why he was able to progress as an actor, because he was able to take chances that a lot of us can take, because maybe we don't have the fan base. So, think, so we're, we're allowed to fail because we have yet to succeed. Wow, what a statement there. Yeah. Um, I think another thing as well is that you have to figure out what type of actor you want to be before you approach this. Like, I've already decided that I want to be a chameleon. I want to do just reinvent constantly, just all sorts of crazy stuff. And you'll always buy it because I'm fully committed to that. You know, I'm not going to like, just cause like I've had people say like, oh, you, you know, you should do like Loki and something else, or you should be like a, a, a vampire, a Viking. And look, I can visually see it and I would have an idea of what to do with that, but I'm not going to go to the most obvious things because acting is about taking on a character that is far from what you are. If you, yes. you, you're becoming someone else. If you're just playing you, then you're not acting, are you? You do, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, like, well, okay, look, this is controversial, but I'm just going to say it. If you take someone like Dwayne Johnson, I love him as The Rock, but as an actor, mm -hmm. right? And I think even he would have to admit this. He's playing. You know he a wrestler, right? Did you know that? I did. I loved <laughs> I a, him. I was, One I was of my favorite wrestlers. With someone, I was having a conversation with someone and said, "Did you know he used to be a wrestler, right?" no really no that's how he will always be in my opinion <laughs> well that's the thing even if you're not a wrestling fan i think that it, it's like that's what he will always be. and he would he's happy and will admit that too it's like that's where he came from that's where he made his bread and butter that's the starting point um then there's always going to be something that someone is not most known for but that doesn't mean that you can't break out of that and try different things you know what i mean like what I was going to say about Dwayne Johnson is he's basically playing like a very specific character. He's playing like the action guy that makes sort of, you know, little, little quips here and there. And, you know, and obviously we know he's got the charisma to, to be funny. And because, my God, like if you look at those old wrestling promos from back in the day, he just destroys people and he still does it. Brilliant. But when you're talking about the type of actor you want to be, he seems quite happy in playing that role. And he's he's tried to do a little bit serious, but he's still in that space and i don't know look, i don't know him i don't know if he's trying to break out of that or if he's just comfortable doing that but my point with this is that you can either be a type of actor that's playing a very specific role again and again and again or you're an actor who plays several different roles or you're an actor who you know like for instance jared leto i think is a really good example of this he does like lots of different types of roles and it's always something very different and sometimes you don't even know it's him you know it's like and that's kind of where i want to be in it like i not to, to be over the top with it but like i see acting as like an art form and that's what i'm focused on i don't care about fame or money or, or like any of that shit like i care about like being believable being telling a good story and and captivating an audience like that's what i think it's about and in order to do that you have to be committed to what you're doing yeah. You know, you have to take it seriously. And I feel like it's just too easy to just do what everyone's expecting of you. So do the unexpected, do what everyone is not thinking you'll do. You know, that's how you're going to get their attention. Absolutely. I think as well with The Rock, he's kind of put the work in. So now oh, they yeah. hired him. He's kind of a brand. The <laughs> Rock. It's the same as Ryan Reynolds, right? The, the good thing mm. with Ryan Reynolds is he, he managed to fit a character with Deadpool that fits his personality. He brought the same range into the Green Lantern, but it didn't work with that character. I think it was timing with that. He did the same with Blade Trinity. It didn't work with that. He did the exact same thing now in Deadpool and it works. So he's, he's kind of, it's almost a character that fit his personality so well that if you look at his career before Deadpool, he was already playing. That. I feel like that's Very timing long. though. Don't you feel? Possibly. Because look at it. You're not wrong. Like, I was aware of him in Blade Trinity days. I thought he smashed it. People say that's a flop. I thought it was a great movie. It wasn't as good as the I first like two. It. I still like it. 
yeah played. same I, th- I thought Brian Reynolds honestly smashed it in that movie he was really funny and like genuinely funny it wasn't like a tr- a guy trying to be funny it was Ryan Reynolds doing what he does best he did a bunch of romantic comedies they were funny Green Lantern was a flop but I think that was more to do with the story rather than his acting um and then yeah he tried things throughout the years I think I think that you sometimes the universe comes together and yeah. it aligns and I think it comes down to having confidence in yourself as well like he kept believing in himself and that's what made him succeed when I look at myself the reason I know I'm going to succeed is because I believe in myself well but the good thing what you're saying as well is you're not you don't want to just accept the fact that you could be typecast it's gonna look it's gonna that's other people that's other people I mean, telling you in terms of the influences that you have you like the almost the Colin Farrells, the Christian Bales, the Jared Leto's, the fact that all the projects they do are so different, different genres, very different characters. You don't want to be Chris Pratt or Ryan Reynolds or The Rock, which is what I like. I like the fact that you you have that. Well, it's boring. I think that the, the, the big thing about it is that I'm, as we've established, a fuss pot. So I'm a fuss pot. I can't you just. Did it. You did it on a, on chopped chips. I remember the scene was <laughs> you have to drink the whiskey and leave. And I remember you did the first take and you sat there because you're always professional at everything, right? And you're there and you're, what's wrong, Christian? No, nothing. Just maybe I could do it a different way. But I just the, felt I wasn't doing you it. You trying to bring things in. But, well, the thing is, it was a very small role, right? Yeah. You're bringing so much into it because you know you could establish yourself better and do a better job at the simplest thing of having a drink, getting up and leaving. Here's the thing, though, just to add to that as well. um, And I appreciate the compliment. Thank you, by the way. Um, It's not all about me. For me, it's the scene. That scene in that film was you are an angry mob boss and you're pissed off. And look, it's a bit tongue in cheek comedy, but we're all supposed to be terrified of you. My character was supposed to be terrified of you. My character also was a bit taller than you, right? Obviously I'm taller than you in real life, but like, and we established it. <laughs> and we established that's why, that's why it. I like working with G. <laughs> we established it in, in like how you were sat and how I was sat. But I knew, for instance, my body language needed to communicate that just because I'm taller than you. I'm still scared of you. So you notice my my shoulders were hunched. I was kind of sat like this. You know, I'm my head's looking down a lot of the time. I, I you well, that's know, that's not I, in the writing. That's not in the writing. No, that's of course I mean not. A collaborative project. It's something you bring into that. The, but I wanted that. I wanted everyone to believe. I wanted it to be believable that I'm scared of your character and that I'm nervous and I'm you know and I was trying to put myself in that headspace of like this nervous guy who owes money uh, and that that's the key. You know what I mean? And I knew by doing that, it's going to make your performance better. It's going to make the whole scene better. Like, that's what I'm thinking overall. Because if I suck in that scene and I'm not doing my job, it means everything else sucks. Because I'm yeah, sure you you know when you're like watching something and it's like all the acting's really good except for this one person. <laughs> yeah, have you seen The Bear on Disney? No. <laughs> yeah, I have a similar opinion with a certain someone in that but it's, it's so disappointing as well because everyone else is like really committed and then you've got this one person who's like yeah oh no i'm so, I'm so terrified oh it's awful and you're like the thing the thing with the bear and i do want to clarify this because there might be a certain point where people come back to this podcast if i am if i do make it and i happen to be working with the cast of the bear the problem with this one person everything about it is very believable and that's what you hit on with Chop Chips. What you said when you came in, it just, I want it to be believable. Everything that you've just mentioned. This specific actor is performing like it's a stage play. Ah. So the acting is very different than the realism that the bear has. And that's the problem that I have. And quite a few people have as well. It's not a controversial opinion. But no, but it's it's solid. It's it's like everything has to match because, as you said, theater acting and on screen acting are two very different things. Like if you're on stage, I know very little. I know very little about stage acting. Yeah, the same. I'm just going from like what I've seen in in like you know on stage of people performing. But what I've noticed is that they 
you know, they they announce themselves more, they're more dramatic, obviously because they have to be, but that doesn't for the nosebleeds. When I when I when I did um professional wrestling, it's the same thing. The move has to look as it does for the person on the front row, as it does at the back. That's why the movements have to be big. So it's the same thing. I've just not attributed that to acting yet. That was just years ago when I did that. But it's got, the same premise. I gotta ask you about this real quick. Professional wrestling, you because I love wrestling. You're a professional wrestler. How long? What happened? Come on. I, I wasn't. I, I did training for professional wrestling. Okay. My cousin, I left for financial reasons. I couldn't continue to make the payments. My cousin stayed at it and has since gone to, uh, you know, the film Fighting With My Family. Yeah. So he, my cousin, has wrestled the the brother of, um, is it Paige? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So obviously not the actor, mm -hmm. but the real guy, the actor, yeah. The real guy, he's wrestled with him numerous occasions and he travels the country. He's, he's gone to Afghanistan wow. to perform in front of the troops. So he has stuck with it. And one of my biggest regrets is not sticking with it because I love, I love acting, I love action and stunt work. And that was the best of all of them, right? So I really wish that I could have stayed at that. I only did it for maybe six months. I was doing it before, obviously, with my cousins, but I learned all the techniques, the moves, everything. I just never went on to actually perform in front wow. of an audience, whereas my cousin did. And um, I think his brother, I've got two cousins, one stuck with it, the other one lasted longer than I did, but then since has come out of it, he's a musician now. They all do their own things, but he wants to really get back into wrestling, and I wish I did. I'm 30 now. I don't think I could get back into it, but it was I, I loved it, and I know you like professional wrestling as well. I love it, and I will say this: don't write yourself off of your age, man, because DDP made it in his mid 30s, and he started like he, he was older than you when he started. Uh -huh. um, there's there's been there's quite a few wrestlers that like get their break and, and start actually making it a bit later in life like so if that's something you wanted to try again just saying you could but but it's the physicality element to it obviously i understand how much that goes into it and stuff like one thing i was i was watching something yesterday um you know maven huffman um tough enough guy no no he's a guy he won the first wwe tough enough and he was like in wwe for like four or five years uh, okay. He famously drop kicked Undertaker out of the Royal Rumble <laughs> and got oh, beaten up for his troubles. When was, when was, when was he performing? Was uh, between 01 to 06, something like that. Oh, okay, so I was still probably watching it about. I'll you would you would have seen him, Russell. Uh, yeah. he, he he's got a YouTube channel and um, it's brilliant to be honest. And he did a video the other day of like it was like a tier list of like the most painful moves and why. Right, he's like breaking through them, and he's like, one thing I kind of realized, which maybe it was a bit naive of me. Like, I knew, I know that wrestling hurt. Like, because whenever someone says like, "Oh, it's fake, it's not real," like, well, you ha you try having someone slam you down on a canvas, buddy, <laughs> and tell me that don't at least because there's a difference, obviously, between like hurting versus pressure. You're throwing pressure at your body, whether it's jumping off a top rope, you know, slamming against something bouncing against something being hit with something like it's gonna hurt but there's varying levels to it and obviously with professional wrestling it's all about protecting each other trying to make things look violent and aggressive but not actually hurting your opponent because you want to work together you want to continue working together and making money but there are just certain moves that just are pain and mm -hmm. like that's there's no way of getting out of that like just a quick example um i remember watching many times like Eddie Guerrero doing like the frog splash or Rob Van Dam doing the frog splash on like Triple H. And one thing I noticed straight away, like this is just apparently what you have to do to protect yourself and stop your ribs from getting crushed. You have to basically like, and you'll notice this next time if you watch a wrestling match and you see the guy jumping off the top rope onto the other guy, he'll tense and he'll kind of right at the last minute be like, oh, like to to protect himself obviously but that's how he stops himself from dying basically is by doing that and that's still gonna hurt because it's a man who might 
weigh like well, two, three hundred pounds. You're not landing with your stomach on their stomach. You're landing no. on your forearms and knees, right? That's yeah. where all the weight from five feet off and then leaping, that's where all the pressure is going. Now, yes, it's quite, with professional wrestling, it's, it's canvas, but it is quite, it can be quite bouncy. Depending on where you're training, <laughs> it's not always the case. If you've ever go to these small events where they have to put the ring up the day of, and when they run into the ropes, the, the sounds that it makes, the creaking, you feel like it's just going to fall apart at any moment. Uh, just complete side question, totally unrelated to uh, wrestling. You worked on Boiling Point. Uh, it, yeah, name only. <laughs> I was name. there for I was I was there for three days and I wasn't really used. Did this you... was about the same time. It was January last year. I was there for three days. I was paid for three days. I was on set for maybe half an hour one of the days. And then I was just in the holding area for pretty much nine hours a day, three days. Did you get to meet, interact with Stephen Graham? I have before. He wasn't. If you've seen the show, it was it was the TV series, mm -hmm. not the film. Got you. If you see the TV series, he's he's not in the kitchen. He is. He's lost a job in the kitchen, and we're following. The series is based on the other actress in it. So I've worked with Stephen Graham a few times. Um, the wrestling film, which I talked about, where I just kept going to the pub. <laughs> he was the lead actor in that. Um, he was in a series called The Virtues, which was filming in Sheffield. We rocked up the set. Within <laughs> about five hours, the AD came out saying, Stephen Graham doesn't fancy it today, so we're not going to use anyone. We're just going to call the shoot off. <laughs> That's great. My train's not for another six hours, so Oof. I'm stuck in Sheffield. So I've I've talked to him, but as an essay, what's, it, what's he like? Him. Like, what's his what's his vibe? As great, he, great. Yeah. He's he seems like he's he's from a working class background, right? Yeah, Liverpool. Like me, and the reason why I I do like Stephen Graham a lot is because he's kind of accepted his accent. I always thought because you're very well spoken. Mm -hmm. when you talk to me in person not like this i'm a lot more i sound a lot more common right i think everyone does to be honest i, I think so but especially because it's associated with the newcastle accent geordie accent i'm from middlesbrough with the smoggies right if you listen to someone who is from middlesbrough they have a very specific regional accent which there's very few people unless it's Game of Thrones, where you have Davos intentionally doing an accent from that region. There's not many famous people from that area who are actors. So I thought that it would kind of be almost yeah. by downfall in some degree where I always have to tone the accent down, where Stephen Graham has managed to overcome that. I and think it's, it's really important to retain it because it can be used for so many different things. Like I've, I've had actors... Oh, well, you remember, you remember that... Um, short uh the extras thing that we did and there was a guy and he was worried about his accent and i was like dude there's like literally productions calling for like people from say yorkshire to do accents mm -hmm. all the time like there's always going to be work there um but you're right yeah getting to the top with with like a regional accent uh, uh it might be tricky but i don't think it's impossible it's just i suppose there's are there are going to be accents that are fitting for different types of projects like specifically like when it comes to my voice um i'm from london i'm not ashamed of of being from london or anything um i have my own, <laughs> my own thoughts about london like feelings but yeah but like I, i'm proud of growing up there and stuff um i grew up in the northwest in the suburbs and but look, i've not lived there in like 10 years do you know what i mean like it's and obviously when you when you go there and you're around family and stuff like it's quite a common human thing that you you almost like revert back to like an older version of yourself, like unconsciously. But I don't know. It's like you're not pretend. You're not trying. Like some deep, some people do. Some people are like I guess they're they're ashamed or or they they're trying to put on a persona or or whatever. And fine, like that is what it is. But like I think for for some of us, it's just like we don't have a discernible accent really. Like obviously, no. I, I spend a lot of time 
practicing and doing stuff with my voice for other characters in like English accents or American accents, but I focus on what the client or the production wants. I'm not really thinking much about how I sound. Um, yes. But, but I've, it's, I've, worked with yeah. actors, I've worked with actors who, when they yell action, they're completely different. It's like, you know, when you're a, a child and you think what acting is, oh, you have yeah. an American accent like that Clint Eastwood kind of, I'm acting and I'm very serious. He kind of goes into that, which I think is just a way to completely disassociate who he is with this character. Yeah, that's, that they is part to, of it. They, don't, they sure. don't want to bring any baggage that they have as an individual to this character. They want it to be completely different, which you admire, but it's also quite strange to see because certainly with myself, I don't really bring any pretension into the films that I do. I'm still a working class guy from yeah. the North East. I'm meeting friends. We're making a film, but the way in which certain people act to that, where they're making anyway. <laughs> no, 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 dude, I'm the same I'm as you. I'm like I'll always be working class born and bred like north um northwest london that's always going to be me that's me as a person i'm not changing you know obviously you change throughout the years but you, you remember where you came from but when it comes to playing roles like i'll base okay like for instance i, I know how to do like posh accents i can do like what people want with with that character but that character i'm basing that on people i've met people like i know what that character is i've met that person that's not me you know, mm -hmm. that's why I find it funny when people say I, I'm well spoken. Like, yeah, I take that as a compliment, but like, that's not because I went to like private school. Like, I went to a public school. You know, like I grew up poor. I, you know, I made the best of things, and I've just had a lot of jobs, customer service jobs, or voice acting or acting business, where I've had to spend a lot of time speaking and making sure okay. the voice. Episode two hundred and fifty. What? This would be two five two. Wow. There we go. Woo. Um, I yeah, I think that helps. If you go back and watch the early episodes of of the show, I mean, I think part of it's confidence as well in in your character and in, in yourself. I can understand why people sometimes get shy of their own accents because they think, like as you mentioned, it might be detrimental. And it's like, nah, you could be proud of of your accent, man. It's important. Like, and I think it's important for realism like going back to Stephen Graham the reason he's such a fantastic actor is he's not a guy trying to be other people but I mean he is but like he's bringing that realness because that's how people speak on the street you know yeah. like I, to be honest I've not really acted a lot with my own accent I've deliberately avoided it and the reason why is I struggle sometimes to act with it because I hate my accent and also um it feels uncomfortable and i know i'm gonna to have to address it i know i have to eventually i have to do that and i will but the mindset has always been it's quite easy for me to slip into different accents different because that's a different character it feels as you mentioned before removed from who i am yeah but when it's your voice that's part of you so when you're playing someone else it's like weird a, a, a big problem that i have with coming into work that someone else has written, I often approach that, even though I'm there as an actor, I'm approaching it like a writer. Yeah. So part of me thinks of how I would want it delivered as opposed to me bringing, and it's something that I, I, maybe I have yet to overcome. If we're talking about faults in what I do, on maybe that is the case. But you look at, say, going back to Stephen Graham, Jack O'Connell, who was in... Uh, a small role in This Is England, the film. From that, he's from the Shane Meadows School of Filmmaking, Realism. The film that he made after that, he approaches on set or whatever, and he's or obviously before that, he's handed a script. And he's, what's this? A script. I have lines that I have to remember. I'm from the Shane Meadows School of, um, we just turn up to set and it's kind of like improvised. We know where the scene goes, but that's where he gets the realism from. It's not always scripted. So all of a sudden when he's on a, I don't want to say a professional shoot, because a Shane Meadows shoot is professional. But when he rocks up, he goes, hang on, but <laughs> it's the realism that they want. And that's the films that he does. The series, The Virtues, when they came out and said, Stephen Graham, um, he doesn't want to work today. That was a Stephen 
uh, that was a Shane Meadows production TV series. I so would just love to work like that, like because I love improvisation. I'd struggle with learning lines. I love, I love that because mm-hmm. it's like a. Don't you feel it's like a wrestling promo? You've got your bullet points. You know where it's going. Yeah, I but like you it. find it's a natural way to get there. Free. I remember we have very little in terms of improv. I think people associated with comedy improv a lot of the time i've done a few improv comedies and i'm often working with people like ray william butler who is a fantastic comedic actor so all of a sudden anything that i'm in which is improv with him i'm not going to be the good one in that not that it's competition but that's always the case right the only time that we did improvise a film i mentioned it partly earlier i spent about a thousand pounds on this film called point pleasant it was based on the Mothman, the legend of the Mothman of New Jersey. I made the costume, animatronic wings. Uh, I built the structure of it because I'm from a special effects background. I did three years Bachelor Honours degree in university doing special effects makeup for TV, film and theatre. So I made this Mothman creature. We got accommodation, travel, hide the generator, got all the lights Camera guy, Pete Allenson, right, we're ready to film it over two nights in Yorkshire. The first camera setup is a shot of a car pulling up, the actor Dale Hooley leaving, drinking a can, throwing it and walking off to the woods. But as he's doing that, there's two red lights in the distance behind him. And they go, and then last minute, it rises above the car. So it's meant to look like there's a car about to hit the back of his but then it flies over and then the car rattles. So there's a lot of moving parts. There was myself, my cousin, a board with two headlights and then on action, I'm running and then lift up last minute. There's a lot going on. We did about six takes of that over the course of two hours and the weather was so bad, Christian, that we had to just call it quits that night. I'd spent a thousand pounds just to get here at this point. I'm not a rich man. Thousand pounds a lot of money. Yeah. So we had to just call it quits. I'm depressed. I'm upset. I go, right, we'll, we'll just go to the pub then. So I go to the pub. I'm drowning my sorrows. I've spent all this money. I came with the impression of making this ambitious short horror film, not on a budget. It's not, it's my money. So I'm drinking. And then Pete Allen, Pete Allenson, God bless him, the camera guy said, it's only a waste if we come away this weekend without anything. We've still got tomorrow. And that stayed with me. So then the next morning, I couldn't sleep that night because of the rain. I'm in a tent without, I bought. I just bought this tent. I opened it, there's no out of it. It's just mesh. So in the middle of the night, I can't sleep. I'm getting dripped on. I'm trying to think of this short film we can make the next day just to salvage this weekend. And then this idea hits me, this short film. I've got myself who I was there as director and producer. I'll just step in as an actor. This other actor will get him. I've got Stuart Alsop, who is the drone operator. My girlfriend, who is like the runner on the shoot and Pete Allenson, the camera guy. There's five creatives who we can do anything. So we go to this location. I have a very basic premise for the story. And I know where I want the scene to go and how I want the scene, the film to end. But how do we get to that? Mm. So what we did is just over the course of three hours at this one location, improvising and trying to bounce ideas while on camera. And then when we yell cut, we'll all come together like the boxing match analogy. What works? What doesn't work? I like that line. I like how you deliver that. Let's do it again. And then we do another tick. And the whole short film, it's on YouTube, became known as Fell Walker, was this improvised five-minute short film, which we none of us went out to make that film. But just to try and salvage the weekend, we come away with this project, which is one of the biggest accomplish, accomplishments, because we were all forced into this corner. We were forced to just try and do something. And I love that. I love... At university, I, I, I was involved in a, a short film. You had to make a seven-minute short film. 
in seven days and they give you a prop and all that stuff, you know. And I like the fact that we have to do it. We ha- This is what we have to do. Otherwise, it's waste. We're all together. It's amazing how much work goes into pre-production of a film. And you can over, com- you know, you can plan everything. And it's a collaborative project. So the moment that you come on set and pitch different ideas, that's what I like. I'd like to just be able to meet up because there's so many networking events where they're just talking about what they want to do. They're looking at the future, where they want to be in the industry. I'd like to just meet up and go, we've got a camera guy, we've got a sound guy, three actors. Let's just see what we can do. That's what I think too, yeah. Like, Why, why is it not like, hey, let's work together? It's all good talking a good game. And next week I'll be meeting G. I'm going drinking with him. We'll be talking about ideas. Yeah. But let's, let's not talk about it. Let's just do it. Yeah, I agree. I, networking I, I, events. I'm, I'm, I'm in a networking event going, there's like 20 really good actors in this room. There's fantastic DOPs. Imagine if you just brought the equipment. We've got this location. Let's just mess about with something. That's what I like. That's why I treat it as a hobby, not a job, because I like spontaneity. I like, I like it planned, but I also like the diversions that you can take in life, career paths. We not know what, we're working next week, you know, who knows? That's what I love. That's what I love about this industry, that you never know what you're going into. So when you ask what's your plan for the year, I have no idea. I'd, I'd like an answer, and I hope that I'm still working the music festivals that I work, but I have no idea what the next film is. Maybe it'll be the film that takes off. Maybe it's just another film that goes on YouTube. I have no idea. Now, I get where you're coming from, man. Like, I... Like my life right now is just a, just all over the place, but I quite like that as well because it's exciting. It's different. Like it's not the nine to five. It's not you know what Monday to Friday brings. Like you don't know what the next day brings. Who knows? Is my shift going to get cancelled tonight? Am I going to be doing this random thing here? Am I going to go out here? Am I going to do this? I'm going to do that. Like next week, I'm in London, for instance. Like it's you, who the fuck knows? You know, it's like. But that's what keeps it interesting. That's what keeps not only what we do interesting, but life interesting. You know? Yes. Yes. It's making the most. It's having stories. It's interacting with people, networking. The amount of people in, dare I say, normal jobs. I think in the industry, they say survival jobs. Jobs that you have to have to pay for. Uh, <laughs> the acting jobs that you want to do. You know? But the amount of times you talk to these people where they don't really have ambition. I don't like that. I, I like. I don't understand that. No, no. You have to. Yeah, you have to make the most of what you have, right? Mm-hmm. If you've got a talent doing that, do that. Well, talent, his, like, like I mentioned that B-roll footage friend that, uh, earlier. Like I just asked because I was just curious, right? But the reason, like, I've started doing that. I've started like making little short film type deals. I put commentary over it. Sometimes like, it will just have no like like for instance i uploaded something on my patreon and it was a day in the life of barista and it was literally just a bunch of clips three four minutes just me as a barista and it was like it, it, something clicked in my head where i was like this is what i should be doing i should be experimenting i have a phone i might not have a professional film camera or whatever but i have a device which will enable me to try things try it's try it, try in the 60s, 70s making films more than they had exactly like it's it's like like you said you you look at what you have and not what you don't have make the best of it and who knows where this could take us there's, there's an actor i worked with um years ago on a nhs training video like a depression suicide at work thing so when it, when you apply for a nursing job you might end up seeing me in these training videos that you see i've done it for jd sports i did it for nhs and there was an actor I was working opposite who I auditioned with called Corin Silver. He's quite high up in the industry now. He's working on the new Spielberg production. He's doing quite a lot of things. It's quite annoying because he's, <laughs> few, he's a few weeks younger than me. So you always feel like you're competing with similar, a similar age as you, right? Mm. Um, oh, where was I going with that? <laughs> I had a point and I completely forgot Corin well, Silver. We, we were talking about people's goals uh, as far as like trying to get somewhere in the industry and having like motivations for, for pursuing things. And I think that like one thing I was mentioning was like how 
we want to try and work together to achieve that and like try different things like be experimental you know and and see where that leads and see where we can take that moving forward mm. we with it wasn't the story i was i was getting to but the next time i worked with corin silver i just hired him to i had g as well we were basically the scene was it was a short comedy sketch two three minutes in length filming at crazy pedro's manchester city center we prepped it all we'd done all the storyboards all the actors together and then as we rocked up on the day we're knocking on the door they wouldn't let us in well we've, we've got this place booked we're filming in the toilets we're not in the restaurant area we're filming in the bathroom no no you can't go in <sighs> so we're there for an hour and a half two hours in costa over the road and then all of a sudden the boss who we'd negotiated with to work there he comes saying, yeah, you just film. So we had three hours to film this sh short sketch. Now, all of a sudden, we have one hour to shoot the short sketch. So it was like we're greyhounds in the box. And then as soon as the door opens, it's run, run. You get the camera set up, you get the thing, everything. And then we did it all. It was the same, similar to what we did do um, in Yorkshire with that film. We just kind of not improvised it. We just had to rush it all. And it came together quite well. But we had to rush with this idea. So it's things that you can't predict. You never yeah, know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like... A short film, you get there, it's raining. Now all of a sudden we're inside filming. What? This completely changes the scene. But it's that spontaneity. Yeah, it, it kind of speaks to that whole thing in life of, of adapting to change. Life it's, ne it's never just going to be textbook. It's never just going to be what you expect. It's always going to be what you don't expect. And how do you make the best of that and maybe make even something better than you'd originally envisioned. I mean, for sure. A couple of final questions for you, completely unrelated to today's show, but just, I ask everyone this, interested for your thoughts. What's the biggest mistake that you've made that you've learned a valuable life lesson from? In filming or in life? It could be <laughs> either, whatever, whatever comes to mind. I think... I often regret the things I don't do than the things I do do. It's quite a broad statement, but I, the things that I'm regretting are the things that I didn't carry on doing, the films I didn't make, the career paths that I could have gone down as opposed to things in life that I have actually done. Because I'm here, I'm relatively healthy. So I... <laughs> It's such a big question that there's so much to answer in terms of personal things, which I don't really want to discuss uh, online. But I think just to wrap that bit up, not yeah. to be, not to breeze past the question, was the things that I didn't do. No, I get it's it, man. At wrestling, it's the fact that I had the op opportunity to make a short film three months ago, and then I pushed it back to January. And now something's happened where we can't film it this month. It's things like that, because that would have started the year off pretty well going straight into production of my own. So then even in between other jobs that I'm doing, I can still be editing that film. So now all of a sudden I'm having to rely on other people's projects for the next, unless I think of an idea or a sh I see a short film that I could just do in a day. I think that's the case. I've not got anything of my own to work for in the next four months as of now. And I wish that I did. I could do. I yeah I could I bet I could just sit there and look through all the the stuff you've got like the scripts and be like oh what we could do this 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 and this with this and you'd be like because oh, that's Chris, what you need so many there's so that's, many but that's what you need that's what you need is is like enthusiasm you need someone to kind of like go oh this is amazing we could do this this and then your mind starts to come alive and you're like oh and that and that is what you're looking for I mean I've got a good friend Bolton filmmaker Dave Green. The amount of conversations of films we have, that's that's what I have. He's my go-to guy when it comes to day drinking, discussing films, because he is so good with ideas. Certainly horror. He's a big horror buff. And we'll just bounce ideas. And I wish that I was either recording those conversations or writing it all down, because we're drinking. And there's so many good ideas where the next day going, what was that film we were talking about? I can't remember. Oh, should have wrote it down. 
bring a little. So that's another thing I, I regret. That's... Not writing, I, you know, waking up for an amazing dreams. Oh, I'll remember that. Oh, I forgot it. The great line of dialogue, I forgot it. It's the little things that I regret, not the, you know. What's the best advice you've ever received? I was waiting for that one. <laughs> Since you said I was going to be on this podcast, I've been trying to think, and for the <laughs> life of me, I can't think. Because <laughs> oftentimes I don't take advice. Yeah. The advice of someone would be get a normal job. No, 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 no. That's not for me. That doesn't excite me. It's I feel been... like I'm butchering these answers. That No, no, no. This is amazing, man. It's not the best sound bites that you're getting, but the best advice i'm honestly i'm not sure i've been well, trying let's, to think let's dice, let's dissect more. that one for instance i mean that's an interesting one you said advice i don't take i think that's brilliant too i mean right there you've been pursuing this for yeah it's about, about nine years give or take right yeah. and people listen i've had people say the same thing i've had people say christian your head is in the clouds you should get a real job you know, what if this doesn't work out? Have you thought about that? Well, the answer to that is no, I haven't thought about it if it doesn't work out because I I'm focused on... What, yeah, I think that's what motivates me. I think yeah. I don't like the compliments. I don't like the, the, the advice that sinks in is the negative advice. It's the ones that I'm not going to listen to. That's it, what stayed with me because otherwise I just kind of... Because you want to prove them out. wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well... Prove me right. <laughs> Not prove them wrong. Prove me right. I know what I'm doing. Leave me to it. Respect. What's the biggest life lesson you've learned so far? That's a very good question. The best life lesson. <sighs> be a good human being. I know that sounds simple, but it's so easy to be distracted on film sets and the way in which you're treated comes back to what we were first talking about, all the SA jobs. Your job is to just talk to me as a human being and we'll get through this, right? The amount of times bad experiences I've had with SAs and arguments that I've had with them, walking off sets, uh, if you just talk to me as a human being, not as someone you could just boss about, but as a human being in all lives of work, that as simple as it is it's just that just be human don't come in with all your pretensions we're going to do this just just be a human being in the pit of very myself. broad answers very yeah. broad answers it's beautiful <laughs> uh, final question for you do you have any upcoming projects or final thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners upcoming projects i'm doing a lot of writing at the moment Mm -hmm. which is quite frustrating because I've so, have so many projects that are written that I should be moving on with. I'm happy to just continue a career in writing, directing a few projects myself, but I'm happy to, because it is a collaborative industry, hand over, sell the script for someone else to take that on. I'm very much happy for that. So I'm doing a lot of writing at the moment. Wednesday coming, we're rehearsing and blocking a short film that I auditioned for last week. I bagged the role. We're filming it next Friday. Congrats. Thank you. After that, I think it'll just be as and when jobs start coming in with different agencies. There's not a big project I'm looking forward to. I'm not actively looking at shooting a film soon. But if something comes along, if... We meet up one day, we talk about something with G, with Dave Green, something will come about. So it's mainly what I'm working on now is just a lot of writing, which is always the case. It's always anticipating that next project, which might not come. But I'm, I'm always on standby, ready for whatever happens, you know, in life this, in general. This has been an amazing conversation because I think not only have I learned more about just filmmaking and in general, but I've learned more about you, which is like, it's quite nice for me to like get more inside your kind of how you approach this, how you think about this. I think that's always been a bit of a mystery to me. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun for me, man. A lot of it, it's not baggage, but it's a lot of things that you want to tell, you want to get off. 
yeah. you know, certain conversations you have with yourself, especially knowing that you're doing a podcast. I'll talk about that. I don't even know if we've, we've not talked about all the projects that we've done or Dude. whatever, but I kind of like that because I felt like I needed to almost project. There the is so in the industry, the things I love and the things I wouldn't change. Basically, that's what the purpose of this has been for me, at least. This has been one of my favorite shows so far, because every now and again, you get a podcast where like, look, here's a full page of notes here. Here's another page of notes here. Like every show I do, I've barely asked any of the questions. Why? Because it's been a conversation because it's been like, there's been a point with it. And as you noticed, I would have been guiding it and, and digging into it. But like a lot of the time you get invested in the conversation and you lose yourself in that. And it, as you said, it's getting things off your chest. It's it's showing the world like this is this is how I think, you know. So for anyone watching, especially in the industry, you'll see that Dan is a filmmaker who's got ideas and enthusiasm. Just needs like you, you to. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you know what we all do sometimes? I know I do sometimes. Sometimes I get like really caught up in myself and negative about things, and then my friends remind me, you know, hey, listen. Get back on the horse, man. It's time to get business done. Like, look at everything you have done, you know. And I say the same to you. Like, nothing drives me more nuts than when you don't see what I see. And of course, we're different people. But when I look at your work, I see, oh, this is brilliant. And like, I can't wait to see what he does next and where he's going to go. And you know what I mean? So it doesn't, to me, it doesn't compute when, when you're like, oh, I don't know, man. Cause I'm like, but what? Like, this is how I see it. And, but that's the thing, isn't it? You, you, you try to big up your friends. You try to make them see how brilliant they are. And I think that's it. It's, it's just remembering that you are brilliant and you've got so much potential. And so you're going to do you know, bigger and greater things just because it's been this long doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Like, don't forget all this time. You've been building your craft. You've been working on what you do. And you've built your own style. The amount of people I've worked with where they don't know what they're doing or they don't know where they like, you know exactly what you're doing. And as you mentioned before, you're ready. You're just waiting. Yeah. Like, and it's that's it. And I'm the same, dude. I'm literally the same. I'm like, look, I can act. I know I can do it. Give me the fucking opportunity and I'll knock it out of the park. You know what I mean? And I say that with Absolutely. complete confidence and it's, that's it, man. That's the mindset you have to have. So I, I appreciate the kind words, man. It's, uh, it's good. I'll be going through my hard drive, all the, all the scripts, partly written features, everything going, ah, just film that. That's a good show reel, Ben. Just film that. Get Christian involved in that. <laughs> well, like I said before, I'd love to work together again. And I know that people would want to see it because Ono Guano was really well received. I loved acting alongside you in Choc Chips. I can't wait to, to see the end result for that. And uh, yeah, obviously our friends like G, I'm working with him on something soon. And I was over the moon when I found out that he was on that. I'm like, oh, great. You know, it's, and that's the thing. It's like, you, it's, you love working with people you worked with before because I think you know what to expect, but you're going to do something different this time. It's always different. And it's like, what can we get out of each other this time? Where can we take this, et cetera? Um, so yeah, looking forward to that for sure. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm motivated for the time being. That's what I need. Just want to say a real, real uh, thank you for appearing on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you very much for having me. And to the listeners of the Christian Reef podcast, I hope you enjoyed this show as much as I did. As always, make sure to like, share and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Make sure to leave us a review on Podchaser, the IMDb of podcasting. I don't know if anyone uses it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've had a few reviews, so thank you to everyone who's who's uh, reviewed it. But yeah, I'm, I'm trying to push it. I think there's something there. Um, if you listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to the show, make sure to leave us a review, a rating, a comment, whatever. It really, really helps us out. If there's any clips that you liked, if you like this show, share it. Share it to the world because you never know who's watching or listening. Thank you so much for listening and watching the show. And until next time, see you in the next one.